we are interrupting our normal programmes to bring you an important announcement. You're watching BBC News from London. A short while ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. In a statement, the palace said, it is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The royal family joined with people around the world in mourning his loss. BBC Television is broadcasting this special programme reporting the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. You're watching BBC News. A short while ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. In a statement, the palace said, It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The royal family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. BBC Television is broadcasting this special programme. Now, Prince Philip was the longest serving royal consort in British history. He was at the Queen's side for more than 70 years. He held a central role in British public life, loyally representing the Queen at home and abroad and supporting the monarch in all of her duties. The Duke had served in the Royal Navy before embracing royal duties full time when his wife became Queen in 1952. He was Her Majesty's closest advisor, responsible for modernising aspects of royal life, making the family more accessible and less formal in its ways. Philip led a remarkably active life, supporting hundreds of charities, campaigning for nature conservation, promoting leadership and encouraging young people to test their abilities in the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme. During his long life, he maintained a close bond with the armed services, especially the Royal Navy, and encouraged his children and grandchildren to serve as he had done. Philip was known for his outspoken style and sometimes his controversial wit and could be relied upon to speak his mind, even on difficult issues. With Philip's death, the royal household has lost a dominant figure. Her Majesty has lost a husband and British public life has lost a powerful presence, a man whose momentous life spanned a century. Let's just remind you of the uh, statement that has been issued in the last few minutes from Buckingham Palace. It says... It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Our Royal Correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, joins us now on the line. Nicholas, a long life now ended, devoted to service to the Queen and the country. Yes, a life of service alongside his wife, as you say. Uh, two months and one day short of what would have been his 100th birthday, a milestone that he was so determined to reach 
and for which the royal family would have gathered in celebration at Windsor Castle. Not a surprise, given his age, given the fact that uh, just over a month ago, of course, he was in hospital for, for a month. Uh, uh, he underwent some uh, heart surgical procedure, uh, but he left hospital looking frail, but returning to Windsor Castle to spend these last weeks with his wife, the Queen. And this is a huge blow for her, as indeed it is for any spouse, leaving, losing uh, a, a partner uh, with whom they have been for more than 70 years, 73 years, a greater span of years than most of us have been uh, alive. So a huge blow for the Queen. And it is fair to say, I think, that in so many ways, the success and the stability of her reign owes a great deal to the success and the stability of their marriage. He was the person to whom she could always turn, the private support which was so invaluable in the isolated position, the lonely position as head of state. It's a huge loss for the royal family. For so long, he was the dominant figure in the family's domestic life, an important source of advice and support for those who married into the royal family, as he did, uh, for William and Harry in their military careers, and for all that he was noted and will be remembered for his abrasiveness, there was also a much more sensitive side to his personality, and that uh, became apparent in the advice that he gave to younger members of the royal family, the advice that he attempted to give to Diana, Princess of Wales, when it was clear that her marriage... Uh, was, was failing. Uh, and there is a gap in our national life now. For so many years, he made a huge and significant contribution, not just to the success of uh, the Queen's reign, but in his own right. He had to find a niche for himself in the nation's life, and he did that. So a little colour has left the national stage today. He was much more than the rather gaff-prone, foot-in-the-mouth caricature, it, it, as he was so often presented a man who made a contribution in his own right, but whose greatest contribution was in the support that he gave to his wife, the Queen. And let's just, uh, before we move on, Nicholas, stay with us if you would. I just would like to read again that statement that's been issued in the last few minutes from Buckingham Palace. It says, It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, his Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The Royal Family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. BBC Television is broadcasting this special programme reporting the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. Nicholas Witchell, our Royal Correspondent, is uh, here. And as you say, a very long-serving consort, the longest serving that we've seen. Uh, but before he married the Queen, he had a very distinguished naval career, Nick. Yes, and there are those who feel that he could have risen to very senior rank within the Royal Navy. And, of course, it was one of the frustrations that he faced in the 1950s that he had to give up that naval career. I mean, he, this is a man who was naturally a dominant personality, a commander, uh, and yet he had to take the subservient role, if you like, uh, in second place, behind the Queen. And he did undoubtedly find that difficult back in the 1950s. Uh, and he had to adapt. He had to find a role for himself. There was no constitutional significance. He was never prince consort. He was never uh, able to see uh, state papers or involve himself in that business, his, his wife, the Queen's business. So that... Uh, added to the frustration that he felt in the 1950s. There was a young queen on the throne, surrounded by experienced courtiers who were suspicious of this young husband who was something of a modernizer in royal terms. And he did then struggle a little with that. He found it difficult, but he found a role for himself. He could be contrary, he could be disputatious, and you have to remember that this was a man with a sharp mind, intellectually very curious, a sharp mind, and of course sometimes a sharp tongue. He could be abrasive and difficult, uh, but uh, it was through that, with this intellectual curiosity, that he developed 
areas of expertise and of curiosity, areas in which he uh, took a particular interest. He was one of the pioneers of the environmental movement, the first president of what was then the World Wildlife Fund. He set up the Duke of Edinburgh's award. That perhaps is the, the, the one entity for which he will be most remembered, giving so many thousands of, indeed hundreds of thousands of young people an opportunity to experience aspects of life that hitherto had been denied to them. He was a resilient personality, self-sufficient, uh, and that, of course, was rooted in the rootless childhood that he had. He came of royal blood from European royalty, uh, 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 and he was adaptable. And he called on all of those qualities to fashion a way, a route for himself through those difficult days in the 1950s, finding a role for himself and settling into that role of support alongside the Queen. Yes, he once said that it was all rather trial and error of, uh, in that role to begin with, finding a way to support the Queen as her consort but and having to devise his own ways of making a contribution to national life. And there were so many thousands of engagements, many of which, of course, we wouldn't have even have been aware of, but he had an extremely busy calendar before he retired. Yes, one of the busiest members of, of the royal family until his retirement from active royal duty in 2017 at the age of uh, 94 or 95. Then. And it was. It was a life, uh, an adult life of service and of duty and of support for the Queen. He made, I think it is reasonable to say, an incalculable contribution to the success of her reign. People who know them both say that she simply could not have done it without him, without this constant source of support to the Queen. Much of it, much of it, private support, never witnessed, never seen by the world. But he was the person to whom she could always turn and on whom she could always rely. And that has now gone. Now, it is important to say that there can be no question of the Queen now withdrawing or retiring. She will continue with her role as the UK's head of state. But it is a great loss to her, a moment of, of, of great sadness for the Queen to lose her husband of 73 years, uh, the man who has been, as you say, the longest serving consort in British history. Nick, for the moment, thank you very much, but do stay uh, with us. Let's remind you of the statement that the palace has issued today. It says, it is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The royal family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. Camilla Tomini is the former royal editor of the Sunday Express and she is the current associate editor of the Daily Telegraph. Uh, Camilla, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, during those uh, 13 years or so that you were the royal editor at the Sunday Express, you travelled many, many times with the Duke of Edinburgh. What are some of the memories that stand out for you? Um, good afternoon and I'm sorry to be here on this sad occasion. Um, yes, I'm I mean, I have fond memories of covering the Duke of Edinburgh's jobs. I travelled to America with him and the Queen back in 2007. They met George W. Bush. Most recently, their last foreign visit was to Berlin, and he was on sparkling form. That was, I believe, in 2015. Um, there was a walkabout in the main city centre, and he was laughing and joking with some medical students um, about the fact that he didn't believe in seeing doctors, always very stoical. And we know that he uh, would have preferred to have been at home and that one month hospital spell where he did undergo surgery on his heart obviously a significant step in ensuring that he could be back home um, for this moment but even when he was convened back to Windsor Castle um, in a car and not an ambulance he was waving to staff who were welcoming in there a very popular figure behind palace gates famed for the fact that he had a very small turnover of staff. In fact, some employees had been working for him literally for decades. 
And um, I reflect as well on what Nick has so eloquently said there of his stalwart support of the Queen. We can't really think of the Queen's reign over the course of nearly 70 years without imagining Philip a couple of steps behind her. And it was like that on jobs. You know, he would almost act as the warm-up man and put people at ease. I know a lot was said about some of his gaffes over the years, but when I observed him at close quarters, he would make a little joke with people just to settle their nerves because when people meet the Queen, they can be sometimes like rabbits in headlights. So he'd make the odd quip and make sure everyone was quite relaxed. Also, as Nick said there, not someone who really likes small talk. If he was going to say something, he would say something challenging or ask an interesting question because he didn't just want to do pleasantries. He was always very well briefed before engagements and wanted to interact and engage with the people that both he and the Queen met. Um, I'm sure right Cam now... Camilla, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I need to go to Downing Street to hear the Prime Minister. It was with great sadness that a short time ago I received word from Buckingham Palace that His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh has passed away at the age of 99. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth and around the world. He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country to have served in the Second World War, at Cape Matapan, where he was mentioned in dispatches for bravery, and in the invasion of Sicily, where he saved his ship by his quick thinking. And from that conflict, he took an ethic of service that he applied throughout the unprecedented changes of the post-war era. Like the expert carriage driver that he was, he helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people and at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this and above all for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Not just as her consort, by her side every day of her reign, but as her husband, her strength and stay of more than 70 years. And it is to Her Majesty and her family that our nation's thoughts must turn today because they have lost not just a much-loved and highly respected public figure, but a devoted husband and a proud and loving father, grandfather, and in recent years, great-grandfather. Speaking on their golden wedding anniversary, Her Majesty said that our country owed her husband a greater debt than he would ever claim or we shall ever know and I'm sure that estimate is correct. So we mourn today with Her Majesty the Queen. We offer our condolences to her and to all her family. And we give thanks as a nation and a kingdom for the extraordinary life and work of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. statement and a tribute from the Prime Minister Boris Johnson outside number 10 Downing Street. Let's just momentarily go to Buckingham Palace uh, where the official notification has been placed upon the gates outside the palace with the statement on it that was released by Buckingham Palace just a short time ago. Let's remind you of what it says. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Well, the leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, has released a statement. And in it, he says, the United Kingdom has lost an extraordinary public servant in Prince Philip. 
My thoughts are with the Queen, the royal family and the British people as our nation comes together to mourn. Let's uh, just take you to Buckingham Palace and uh, see that notice, if we can, of uh, the notification that has been placed upon the gates. I hope uh, we might be able to show that to you in just a moment. These, this is the notification that's been placed outside Holyrood in Edinburgh. As you can see, it says that further announcements will be made in due course. Let's return to Camilla Tomini, a former royal editor for the Sunday Express, now associate editor of the Daily Telegraph, and the Prime Minister there expressing great sadness and condolences for the Queen, acknowledging the extraordinary public duty that Prince Philip did alongside the Queen, never outshining her, Camilla, always complimentary. That's right. And I think um, we very much view him, don't we, at 99 um, as very much a man of his generation. Uh, Boris Johnson there mentioning the fact that he was mentioned in dispatches during the Second World War. He had to put his own military career in the Navy aside to support the Queen and become her liege man of life and limb. And of course, she described him as her strength and stay all these years. And um, he effectively decided that he needed to do something with his position in order to try and bring a greater good. And we saw that through the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, but equally in quite a lot of the reforms that happened behind palace gates, there was always this sense that yes, the Queen is head of state, but he was head of the household and the ultimate patriarch. And as well, of course, working well beyond retirement age, that notion of him retiring at uh, 95 or 96 in 2017, where most people would have been putting their feet up for 20 odd years, seemed extraordinary to those around him. But a very talented man, um, somebody who wrote a great deal of books as well on um, environmentalism and um, conservation. Prince of Wales has obviously inherited that gene from his father. But I think the effect on the Queen, of course, is going to be profound. Uh, the closest comparison we can perhaps make, and I remember it vividly, is during the Diamond Jubilee when Prince Philip was taken ill and there was a service at uh, St Paul's Cathedral and the Queen very purposefully walked down one side of the aisle as she went to take her seat in the pews. And that's because she was so used to having Prince Philip by her side, even when he had been hospitalised that weekend, she walked in her position because she thought or, of course, reflected on the fact that she always has a right hand man by her side. So, of course, this is going to have a profound effect on her and the rest of the family because Prince Philip was the head of that family. Camilla, we appreciate you sharing your reflections on Prince Philip and the time that you spent with him on those many royal tours when you were the royal editor for the Sunday Express. Thank you very much. Here we see the flag flying at half-mast above uh, Buckingham uh, Palace where the notice has been placed upon the gates with the statement reading from Buckingham Palace, it is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell is here with me now and uh, a very long life on which we can reflect one hallmarked by extraordinary public service, Nick. Yes, hallmarked by service and duty and loyalty and all those rather old-fashioned characteristics that he and the Queen personify. And it is a moment of real sadness, obviously, for the Queen, for the royal family, she has lost her spouse of 73 years, almost unimaginable, isn't it? A, a period of 73 years of marriage. They met just before the outbreak of the Second World War when she was just a, a teenage uh, young woman, young, young child, really. Uh, but they stayed in touch during the war and they were married. There are pictures of their marriage, married in 1947. And uh, a keen sportsman, always very active for the, the uh, Prince Philip uh, here playing polo. He only gave that up in late in his life. And they started their family. 
Prince Charles there, born in 1948. And we think of the family, the loss of a father, uh, the loss of the person who was really a stabilizing and dominant feature within the family, the royal family. Uh, there were strains, of course, within that family, and sometimes in the 1950s they were particularly felt by the Duke of Edinburgh when he felt that he didn't have a role, but he found it and travelled widely there uh, on one of those many travels around the world, but traditionally and customarily beside his wife, the Queen, quite literally a couple of paces behind her, but always in support, and at the same time developing a life and a career, if you like, of his own, developing interests in technology, in young people, in uh, spiritual matters. And this is a man with a, a keen intellectual curiosity about things. He wrote several monographs investigating matters, uh, but he will be remembered predominantly for his role in support of the Queen. Uh, she couldn't have done it without him, is what somebody who has known them both for decades said. An, an incalculable contribution. Uh, it was at the coronation that we see pictures of there that he made his oath, the first to pledge loyalty after the bishops, to be faith and truth I shall bear unto you. And I think it is fair to say that he has discharged his own coronation oath, the oath that he made to his wife, the Queen, on the occasion of the coronation in 1953, he has discharged that oath with distinction because he has always been there for her. All, all right, there were some bumpy patches in the 1950s, but once he found a role, because of course he had no constitutional significance, he found a role and he pursued that whilst at the same time always being in support of his wife as they brought up their family. And there, I think, uh, that from the Diamond Jubilee, it looks like, when he was uh, well into his 90s, but always a vigorous man, both physically and mentally. Now, sometimes that got him into trouble. Um, he would make his, uh, what he would intend to be and hope to be humorous asides, and sometimes they didn't quite work out. Very often it was done to break the tension. You walk into a room and lots of people are there waiting to, to, to meet the Queen and the royals, and he would make a, what he would hope to be a wise crack, and sometimes it just uh, fell flat. And uh, uh, he will be remembered uh, in part for the gaffes. Um, he once said, you know, I think I, uh, I'm going to cease putting my foot in my mouth. So he was aware of some of those gaffes, which, uh, some of which, of course, were made on the many foreign visits that he made, most notably in China in the 1980s. Uh, but that should not overshadow the very real contribution that he made to the life of this nation and indeed to other nations around the world. We think of the World Wildlife Fund, the Duke of Edinburgh's award, which I think is active in something like 70 countries around the world. Uh, a remarkable life of service to his wife, to the Queen, to this, his adopted nation. He was uh, born, of course, a, a prince of, um, of Greece. There was no Greek blood in him at all. He was uh, essentially Danish and some German and Russian blood. And it is worth just remembering that he, like his wife, was a great-great-grandchild of Queen Victoria. So he was of royal blood, actually. Some people say he was more royal than the Queen because both his parents were from uh, a royal dynasty. Um, but he came to this country uh, because his uh, parents' marriage broke up. They were banished from Greece, and he was brought up uh, largely in this country, joined the Royal Navy, changed his name to Mountbatten, uh, and had a distinguished uh, record in the Second World War, uh, after which came marriage to the then Princess Elizabeth and the start of a family, and then soon after that, the transition to uh, her role as Queen and his role as consort, uh, prince consort, not never formally prince consort, uh, but uh, uh, the the the, wife, the the companion of the queen, uh, and that role which he has discharged. I think even critics of the royal family, I think, would accept that he has fulfilled that role with distinction. Not always a very easy role, uh, a dominant personality forced into this supportive role. And it is in that role that he travelled the world and made his contribution. Nick, for the moment, 
Thank you very much. Do stay with us, though. The Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has released a statement. It says, I am saddened by news that the Duke of Edinburgh has died. I send my personal and deepest condolences and those of the people of Scotland to Her Majesty the Queen and her family. We're joined now by the royal biographer and historian Robert Lacey. Thank you very much, Robert, for joining us. And I'm sure you, like everyone, will wish to reflect upon the extraordinary life, fascinating life in many ways, um, with so many facets to it that the Duke of Edinburgh managed to carve out when he became consort to the Queen. Well, like many people watching, um, he's, he's, he's been a part of our life, hasn't he? Um, um, part of the Queen, and uh, you know, we, we must all, of course, all of us be remembering and thinking now of the Queen, um, f of whose life he has been such an integral part. Only last night, there was the, the program on television, The Secret Life of the Queen, and the secret ingredient there of her, her emotional success and her public success and his historical success. It was, well, it was always not a secret. It was Prince Philip, as, as Nick has just been saying, um, from a um, very different background in some ways, um, but uh, playing such um, a role in, in the life of the nation. Um, um, I've been involved with, with The Crown, the TV series, and um, um, it was no accident that we decided to feature Prince Philip very strongly in the episode we made about the moon landings um, and the way in which this captured in the 1960s Prince Philip's interest in science um, that Nick has been talking about, but then how um, he came to see that science will only take you so far in life. And he developed um, his intense personal religious faith, um, working with um, uh, Dean Woods at, at Windsor um, to, uh, in a particular sense, to, to, to give fresh spiritual strength to um, clergymen who were a bit jaded in, in their mission in life. And that proved the same thing for him. Such a thinking man. Uh, again, Nick talked about the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme um, um, of such importance, obviously, to the young people whose lives were, 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 were changed by it, um, but also bringing the monarchy into touch with um, everyday life um, in, in a fresh way. I, I would not want to, to diminish the wonderful achievement of the Queen um, uh, in, in um, her reign, but uh, so many of her fresh ideas and fresh initiatives um, came from this remarkable man. Hundreds of public engagements that he carried out each year, amounting to tens of thousands over his uh, lifetime, retiring well into his uh, 90s, just a few years ago. And of course, rather baffled by the constant press attention, wasn't he? That he, had, he seemed to be uh, am amused by the attention that he got when he was carrying out these engagements. Yes, um, I think that was partly a very clever act. Um, I think he hated the press as much as every other member of the royal family, but he, he, he had, and, and its intrusion, but he understood its purpose um, and um, he adapted to that. It was his idea, of course, um, back in the 1960s that um, the royal family should embark on its um, royal family film, which most of us thought was a great success, but which the family came to rather regret. Um, and it's rather interesting, it's only actually now in the days of COVID, with the Queen going on Zoom um, and all the other members of the family going on Zoom, that we're actually getting in touch with the family in a personal way um, uh, that he originally envisaged um, back there through, through television. Um, uh, you, you were talking just then of um, his public engagements, and I'm sure even as you said those words, viewers have a picture coming to their mind of um, his, yes, the sardonic smile you mentioned, often hands behind the back, often unfailingly a step behind Her Majesty. Um, um, but 
always there clearly in in the most supportive sense let us show you the the, the uh, official statement the official notice if we can being brought we can just let you know that there has been an official notice put on the gates of uh, buckingham palace here it is being brought out with some ceremony as you would expect brought across the courtyard at the front of Buckingham Palace to the gates to be placed there to notify the public of the passing of Prince Philip. On it a statement from Buckingham Palace issued some time ago. It reads, it is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. It goes on to say, further announcements will be made in due course. The Royal Family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. The First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, has also released a statement. He says, Throughout his long and distinguished life, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh served the Crown with selfless devotion and generosity of spirit. We offer our sincere condolences to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, his children and their families on this sad occasion. Well, our Royal Correspondent uh, Nicholas Witchell is uh, here and everyone touching on the same sorts of themes, uh, Nick, of uh, service and the support that he's given to the Queen. And of course, she is uppermost in everybody's minds because it is her husband who she has lost. Yes, and the fact, as everybody is testifying, that he has made such a huge contribution to the success of this reign. Um, people have referred to the fact that she said at the time of the Golden Jubilee, my, he is my strength and stay. Less remembered is that she returned to the theme at the time of the Diamond Jubilee when she said, he is my constant strength and guide. Now, the Queen is very careful in her choice of words. So in both of those references, she referred to strength, to my guide. Now, she was saying that at the time of the Diamond Jubilee when she'd been on the throne for 60 years. So for, for her to pay that kind of tribute, to use that kind of wording in reference to her husband, my strength and guide. And that, I think, gives a real clue to the significance that he played in her life, in supporting and helping her to discharge the responsibilities as head of state. Remember, they're quite different in personality, in, in, in character. The Queen, traditionally and, and, and instinctively cautious, and quite a reserved person. That was really quite a challenge for her back in the 1950s. Philip, by contrast, full of self-confidence, some would say actually rather arrogant, uh, and quite a moderniser in the terms of the royal family, certainly back in the 1950s. A an iconoclastic approach to things. But together, it really worked, this partnership between the two of them. He in support, this dominant personality in this constantly supporting role. Uh, but that is a role that he adapted to, adjusted to, and found actually that he was rather well suited to it because he was utterly loyal in his uh, belief in the importance of the role that the Queen was fulfilling and in his duty to support her. Now, he also went off uh, I think this was at the time, perhaps, of his... Uh, well, here we are, we're back to the, to the wedding back in 1947. This young couple, she, uh, um, uh, in her early 20s, just 21, I think she was at the time of her wedding, he five years older than her, and uh, uh, a love match, you know. He means the world to her, is what one person who has known both of them for decades said to me. She's absolutely devoted to him and he to her. And it was the importance, the, the uh, solidity of that relationship, of their marriage, which was really so important uh, in the success of the reign. So I think that he has made a huge contribution, uh, both in terms of the nation and in terms of the support to her. Nick, thank you very much. Well, Nick has been taking a look back at the Duke of Edinburgh's long and eventful life. First after them, her husband, Philip, 
Duke of Edinburgh, who with his hands between the hands of the Queen becomes her liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. In the name At of God. At the Queen's coronation, he was the first person after the bishops to pay homage to her. Philip knelt before his wife and pledged his loyalty. Faith and truth I will bear unto you. And so, rising, touches the crown upon her head and kisses her upon the left cheek. As a male consort to a female sovereign, Philip had no constitutional significance. Yet no one was closer to the monarchy or of greater importance to the monarch than he was. By instinct he was a leader, yet Philip had always to take second place. By nature, he spoke his mind, and that sometimes got him into trouble. Yet, for decade after decade, his was the support that mattered most to the throne. Philip was born in Corfu in 1921. His family was part of European royalty. He was a prince of Greece, but his ancestors were largely Danish, German and Russian. Philip had a rootless childhood, his family was banished from Greece, his parents separated, and he was sent to Gordonston School in northern Scotland. The Spartan atmosphere there suited him. As the Second World War loomed, Philip was an 18-year-old Royal Navy cadet at Dartmouth. His Majesty walking down the ranks of the cadets. And when the King and Queen visited the college, they brought with them their 13-year-old daughter, Princess Elizabeth. According to witnesses, Philip showed off a great deal, but the meeting had made a deep impression on the princess. Philip served in the Royal Navy with distinction during the war. When the fighting ended, he started to escort Elizabeth to family gatherings. He changed his name to Philip Mountbatten and became a British citizen. The public realised there was a romance. Yet within Buckingham Palace, Philip was regarded with suspicion. One courtier wrote privately that he was rough, uneducated and would probably not be faithful. But Elizabeth was deeply in love and in the summer of 1947, the palace announced their engagement. It is with the greatest pleasure that the King and Queen announced the betrothal of their dearly beloved daughter, the Princess Elizabeth, to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, R.N. On the 20th of November, 1947, the newly created Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, stood within Westminster Abbey and exchanged marriage vows with the heir to the British throne. I, Philip, I, Philip, take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. Take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. for Elizabeth and Philip. Again and again, they joyfully responded. In 1952, the couple set off on a tour of the Commonwealth. The King came with them to the airport. It was the last time they were to see King George VI, who, unknown to his daughter, was in the final stages of lung cancer. It was a farewell. It was also, as events turned out, goodbye. It was at a hunting lodge in Kenya that Philip told his wife of her father's death. Someone who was there said Philip looked as though half the world had dropped on him. They returned to London to lead the national mourning. And now here is the Queen. His wife was now Queen. Philip was there in support, but he was never given the title Prince Consort and his role was undefined. He channeled some of his restless energy into a boisterous social life. He and a group of male friends met every week in rooms above a restaurant in London, Soho. There were long, convivial lunches, visits to nightclubs and glamorous companions. By the 1960s, Philip's life was more settled. He and the Queen had completed their family with two more children, Andrew and Edward, who joined Charles and Anne, and he had found a new role for himself. Is it the 18th we're due back now? 18. From his office in the palace, he promoted issues in which he had a personal interest. 40 minutes to get round the world. Well, it's going to be a bit of a rush. It may leave you a little bit muddled. Yet diplomacy but, uh, seemed alien to him. He urged British industry to pull its finger out and complained on American television that the royal family didn't have enough money. Inevitably, if, if, uh, if nothing happens, we shall either have to, uh, I don't know, we may have to move into smaller premises, who knows? <laughs> he blundered on a state visit to China with the Queen. He made what he thought was a private remark about slitty eyes. It was a diplomatic gaffe which dominated the headlines and added to his reputation for making misjudged remarks. It's all right, Smith. No. 
Yet Philip had a sharp, inquiring mind and was determined to make a contribution of his own. The groundbreaking 60s film Royal Family was made largely at his instigation because he felt it was time for the family to show a more human face to the world. The salad is ready. Good. And for many years, he toured the globe as president of the then World Wildlife Fund, speaking out about the need to conserve nature. We depend on being part of the web of life. We depend on every other living thing on this planet, just as much as they depend on us. He promoted technology, helped underprivileged children, and had a lifelong interest in spiritual issues. But his most lasting creation was the scheme named after him, the Duke of Edinburgh's award, which encouraged young people to realise their potential. To give young people a chance to discover their own abilities for themselves as an introduction to the responsibilities and interests of the grown-up world, and incidentally, to make new friends and have a great deal of fun and satisfaction in the present. Believe <laughs> it. <laughs> No decade was more difficult for the royal family than the 1990s. The death of Diana, Princess of Wales, was both a family tragedy and a moment of tension for the monarchy. It was the Queen to whom the country looked for public comfort. It was Philip to whom the Queen turned for private support. And still Prince William with his head hung, walking next to his grandfather. It was Philip whose gentle encouragement had persuaded William and Harry to walk behind their mother's coffin to her funeral. And contrary to his sometimes insensitive image, it had been Philip who'd taken the lead in trying to understand the domestic problems of his children, prompted perhaps by his own memories of what it's like to marry into the royal family. Philip remained physically active at an age when most men would have relished retirement. He went carriage driving and he was still carrying out more engagements than many younger members of the family. Some he did alone, such as this visit to British troops in Iraq. How did you get into this? <laughs> but most he did with his wife. He was the figure a few paces behind the Queen, always looking out for her and often guiding children through the barriers to present their flowers to her. By the time of his 90th birthday in June 2011, celebrated at his insistence with little fanfare, he'd accepted that it was time to slow down a little. I reckon I've done my bit. I, I want to enjoy myself for a bit now. Um, with less responsibility, less uh, frantic rushing about, less preparation, less trying to think of something to say. Um, and on top of that, memories going, I can't remember names and things. Yes, I, I'm just sort of winding down. There was little immediate evidence, though, of any winding down. Despite a serious health scare at Christmas 2011, when he had to be taken to hospital with a blocked coronary artery, he remained at the Queen's side for most of her Diamond Jubilee programme, which took them the length and breadth of the country. It wasn't until 2017 that the Duke, then aged 96, carried out his final solo engagement. It was a parade for the Royal Marines on the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. It was pouring with rain, but, as ever, duty took priority. He took his time meeting those on parade and taking the salute as the Marines marched past to bid him farewell. His life after that was much quieter, spent mostly at the Queen's estate at Sandringham. It was there in January 2019, while he was driving himself from the estate, that he survived a serious road accident. His vehicle overturned, he was badly shaken, and he surrendered his driving licence shortly afterwards. By now he was rarely seen in public. There were occasional appearances at family occasions such as weddings, yet he remained a supportive figure to the Queen and his family. Throughout his adult life, despite the formality of his position, Philip retained his own style of doing things. He made his own uncompromising mark on national life. He once summed up his approach in characteristically forthright fashion. I've just done what I think is my best. I can't suddenly change my whole way of doing things. I can't change my interests. I can't change my the way in which uh, I react to things. It's, it's, it's part of it's somebody's style and, and it's too bad. It's really lumpy. 
throughout all the monarchy's many ups and downs since the Second World War, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, the longest serving consort in British history, was the restless outsider who put his wife and duty first. In doing so, he fulfilled his coronation oath of allegiance to Elizabeth, his queen. Their marriage and his support were the essential foundations which underpinned the success of her reign. In a speech to celebrate their golden wedding anniversary, the Queen spoke of the debt that she and the country owed him. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, at the age of 99. Prince Philip was by far the longest serving consort in British history, a role he shaped from the start. Try and grow into it, and, and that was by trial and error. And, um, I, there, was, there was no precedent. But if I asked somebody what you expect me to do, they all looked blank. They had no idea. Nobody had much idea. He was 26 when he married the then Princess Elizabeth in 1947. Within five years, she would be queen. He has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. Tributes to Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, are coming in from around the world and, of course, many messages of condolences uh, for Her Majesty the Queen. The Duke played a pivotal role as father and across the generations of the royal family. He'll be remembered for his support for the Queen for almost 70 years throughout her reign at thousands of public events and, of course, in private. His career began in the Royal Navy, where he served during the Second World War and ended after his wife's coronation. And also for encouraging millions of young people worldwide through the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, which he founded in the 1950s. In recent years, there had been many signs that the Duke of Edinburgh's health was declining. He'd been admitted to hospital a number of times throughout the last decade. He had returned home to Windsor on the 16th of March this year, after a month-long stay in hospital in London. His loss will be felt most keenly by Her Majesty the Queen, by the family and beyond. Good afternoon, welcome to our viewers around the world for the news that is breaking today because within the past hour, Buckingham Palace has announced the death of His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, he was 99 due to celebrate his 100th birthday in June of this year. He was the longest serving royal consort at any time in British history. In a formal statement, the palace said this. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. 
Further announcement will be made in due course. The royal family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. A long and rich life for people to be reflecting on today and, of course, on the contribution that Prince Philip made, not just in the UK and beyond. We'll come on to the life story, Nick. Nicholas Witchell, our royal correspondent, in a moment. Um, I think first we should pause and think about the sense of loss for the Queen and the royal family. Yes, this is a moment of real national sadness. Two months and one day short of what would have been his 100th birthday, a milestone that he was so determined to reach and that his family was so keen that he should achieve. Um, a moment of sadness, most particularly, of course, for the Queen, losing her husband of 73 years, a bigger span of years than most of us can imagine, the longest-serving consort in British history. The Queen absolutely devoted to him, and I think it's perhaps not widely recognised what a team effort the reign of Elizabeth II has been and the degree and the importance of the support given to her throughout her long reign by her husband, the one person to whom she could always turn, on whom she could always rely. There were difficult, frustrating periods in the 1950s. He had to adapt to this role, uh, uh, a supportive role, a dominant personality, a commanding personality that he was. He could have gone far in the Royal Navy, but he had to adapt and find a role for himself. And he did that. Uh, and apart from the sadness of the Queen, which will be profound, though, of course, she will continue in the role as Queen. There will be no question of her now withdrawing or retiring from that role. It, there will be great sadness within the royal family. And we must remember that they have lost a father or a grandfather or even a great grandfather. And we remember the role that the Duke played within the family, the dominant role within that family and a source for all his abrasiveness for all his contrariness on occasions, he could also show great sensitivity, particularly to those marrying into the royal family. As, and I think it would be fair to say that he is probably one of the most influential outsiders to marry into the British royal family alongside the Queen Mother mm -hmm. and Princess Diana. And he showed that sensitive side to his nature in the efforts that he made to save the marriage of his son, Prince Charles, and Diana, Princess of Wales. And there is now this gap in national life. Um, he's been less evident, of course, in recent years since his retirement from active royal life in 2017. But for so many decades, he was a colourful character. He was a, a, a force within the life of this nation and indeed of other nations around the world and particularly within the Commonwealth. And he has been absolutely central to the success of this reign. I think it is fair to say that the success and the stability of Queen Elizabeth's reign owes so much to the success and the stability of her marriage to Prince Philip, a man of royal blood himself, both he and the Queen, great-great-grandchildren of Queen Victoria. He knew instinctively what was required in that role, notwithstanding the fact that he was an outsider. He was, a, by character, a restless individual, but he wasn't the product of Eton and the Guards and Oxford or Cambridge. He was a prince of Greece, though there was no Greek blood in him, banished from that country, uh, had a, a, a rootless childhood, and the Queen fell in love with him. And, well, the rest, as they say, is history. Um, he has discharged his duty to her, the duty that he pledged at the time of the coronation, to be uh, faith and truth I shall bear unto you. And he found a role for himself, an important role, and made a significant contribution in his own right to the life of this nation. We will talk uh, and have plenty of time a little later, Nick, to talk about the colourful character, uh, the slightly abrasive character at times, as you say, um, the energetic person that he was, the man of ideas, the man who modernised the royal family in many ways. Um, can I just pick up once again on where this leaves Her Majesty? We know of her resilience. Uh, we know of her sense of duty. We know, as you say, that there'll be a steadfast determination to carry on with that duty. And yet, there will be a weakening, surely, of the Queen's own sense of this, what was a team effort. Well, I wouldn't... She will miss him hugely. It will not, though, have come 
as a surprise, his death, for somebody two months short of his 100th birthday, there will be, of course, an emotional shock that finally he has passed away. There will be deep, deep sadness. But I think that the Queen's attitude will be that she will continue with her duty. Um, we shouldn't forget that ten years ago now, uh, Prince Philip had a serious heart episode when he was rushed to Papworth Hospital, and I'm told by you know people who do know that on that occasion she thought that she had lost him. Right. So she will have over the years, I think, have uh, as as every couple does uh, when they are in their nineties, they become they they uh, brace themselves for the moment of uh, when when their partner when their spouse passes away. Um, it is particularly accentuated, perhaps, in the case of this couple because of the very solitary, lonely position in which the Queen, as head of state, finds herself. So in that position, she will have relied more than usually on the support of the one person to whom she could always turn. Uh, but I think that she will continue. There will be a period of great sadness. The rest of the royal family will, of course, rally around and be there, uh, notwithstanding their own sadness. You know, um, um, they, they have lost, as I say, fathers and grandfathers. Uh, but it, it, is, it will not come, I think, as a surprise to them, because as we saw when uh, the Duke left hospital on the 16th of March, he looked very frail then. Nick, we'll talk a little more uh, later. Thank you so much for now. Um, uh, if you're just joining us, wherever you're watching around the world, uh, this is our special programme from BBC News on the day that Buckingham Palace uh, announced uh, the sad news that His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, has died at the age of 99. We'll have all the tributes that come in for you. Uh, we'll be talking again about uh, where this leaves the royal family. Um, and Nick there hinting at the fact that, of course, uh, the prime duty of the family will continue, but the balance within it will have changed after this news. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, as well, his contribution, very big contribution to public life uh, in the United Kingdom uh, over many years uh, since that marriage to Princess Elizabeth back in 1947. So it's a long and a rich life that we are talking about today, not without its controversy at times. Let's be clear about that as well. So Nick, Nick Nicholas Witchell, our Royal Correspondent, has been considering all of this and he looks back now at Prince Philip's life. First after them, her husband, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, who with his hands between the hands of the Queen becomes her liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship in the name At of At the God. Queen's coronation, he was the first person after the bishops to pay homage to her. Philip knelt before his wife and pledged his loyalty. Faith and truth I will bear on you, live and die. And so, rising, touches the crown upon her head and kisses her upon the left cheek. As a male consort to a female sovereign, Philip had no constitutional significance. Yet no one was closer to the monarchy or of greater importance to the monarch than he was. By instinct, he was a leader, yet Philip had always to take second place. By nature, he spoke his mind, and that sometimes got him into trouble. Yet for decade after decade, his was the support that mattered most to the throne. Philip was born in Corfu in 1921. His family was part of European royalty. He was a prince of Greece, but his ancestors were largely Danish, German and Russian. Philip had a rootless childhood. His family was banished from Greece, his parents separated, and he was sent to Gordonston School in northern Scotland. The Spartan atmosphere there suited him. As the Second World War loomed, Philip was an 18-year-old Royal Navy cadet at Dartmouth. His Majesty walking down the ranks of the cadets. And when the King and Queen visited the college, they brought with them their 13-year-old daughter, Princess Elizabeth. According to witnesses, Philip showed off a great deal, but the meeting had made a deep impression on the princess. Philip served in the Royal Navy with distinction during the war. When the fighting ended, he started to escort Elizabeth to family gatherings. He changed his name to Philip Mountbatten and became a British citizen. The public realised there was a romance. Yet within Buckingham Palace, Philip was regarded with suspicion. One courtier wrote privately that he was rough, uneducated and would probably not be faithful. But Elizabeth was deeply in love and in the summer of 1947, the palace announced their engagement. It is with the greatest pleasure 
that the king and queen announced the betrothal of their dearly beloved daughter, the Princess Elizabeth, to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, RN. On the 20th of November 1947, the newly created Philip Duke of Edinburgh stood within Westminster Abbey and exchanged marriage vows with the heir to the British throne. I, Philip, I, Philip, take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. Take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. Again and again, the people called for Elizabeth and Philip. Again and again, they joyfully responded. In 1952, the couple set off on a tour of the Commonwealth. The King came with them to the airport. It was the last time they were to see King George VI, who, unknown to his daughter, was in the final stages of lung cancer. It was a farewell. It was also, as events turned out, goodbye. It was at a hunting lodge in Kenya that Philip told his wife of her father's death. Someone who was there said Philip looked as though half the world had dropped on him. They returned to London to lead the national mourning. And now here is the Queen. His wife was now Queen. Philip was there in support, but he was never given the title Prince Consort and his role was undefined. He channeled some of his restless energy into a boisterous social life. He and a group of male friends met every week in rooms above a restaurant in London, Soho. There were long, convivial lunches, visits to nightclubs and glamorous companions. By the 1960s, Philip's life was more settled. He and the Queen had completed their family with two more children, Andrew and Edward, who joined Charles and Anne, and he had found a new role for himself. Is it the 18th we're due back now? 18. From his office in the palace, he promoted issues in which he had a personal interest. 40 minutes to get round the world. Well, it's going to be a bit of a rush. It may leave you a little bit muddled. Yet diplomacy but, uh, seemed alien to him. He urged British industry to pull its finger out and complained on American television that the royal family didn't have enough money. Inevitably, if, if, if nothing happens, we shall either have to... Uh, I don't know, we may have to move into smaller premises, who knows? <laughs> he blundered on a state visit to China with the Queen. He made what he thought was a private remark about slitty eyes. It was a diplomatic gaffe which dominated the headlines and added to his reputation for making misjudged remarks. It's all right, Snip. No. Yet Philip had a sharp, inquiring mind and was determined to make a contribution of his own. The groundbreaking 60s film Royal Family was made largely at his instigation because he felt it was time for the family to show a more human face to the world. The salad is ready. Good. And for many years he toured the globe as president of the then World Wildlife Fund, speaking out about the need to conserve nature. We depend on being part of the web of life. We depend on every other living thing on this planet just as much as they depend on us. He promoted technology, helped underprivileged children, and had a lifelong interest in spiritual issues. But his most lasting creation was the scheme named after him, the Duke of Edinburgh's award, which encouraged young people to realize their potential. To give young people a chance to discover their own abilities for themselves as an introduction to the responsibilities and interests of the grown-up world, and incidentally, to make new friends and have a great deal of fun and satisfaction in the present. <laughs> no decade was more difficult for the royal family than the 1990s. The death of Diana, Princess of Wales, was both a family tragedy and a moment of tension for the monarchy. It was the Queen to whom the country looked for public comfort. It was Philip to whom the Queen turned for private support. And still Prince William with his head hung walking next to his grandfather. It was Philip whose gentle encouragement had persuaded William and Harry to walk behind their mother's coffin to her funeral. And contrary to his sometimes insensitive image, it had been Philip who'd taken the lead in trying to understand the domestic problems of his children, prompted perhaps by his own memories of what it's like to marry into the royal family. Philip remained physically active at an age when most men would have relished retirement. He went carriage driving and he was still carrying out more engagements than many younger members of the family. Some he did alone, such as this visit to British troops in Iraq. How did you get into this? <laughs> but most he did with his wife. 
He was the figure a few paces behind the Queen, always looking out for her, and often guiding children through the barriers to present their flowers to her. By the time of his 90th birthday in June 2011, celebrated at his insistence with little fanfare, he'd accepted that it was time to slow down a little. I reckon I've done my bit. I, I want to enjoy myself for a bit now. Um, with less responsibility, less uh, frantic rushing about, less preparation, less trying to think of something to say. Um, and on top of that, memories going, I can't remember names and things. Yes, I, I'm just sort of winding down. There was little immediate evidence, though, of any winding down. Despite a serious health scare at Christmas 2011, when he had to be taken to hospital with a blocked coronary artery, he remained at the Queen's side for most of her Diamond Jubilee programme, which took them the length and breadth of the country. It wasn't until 2017 that the Duke, then aged 96, carried out his final solo engagement. It was a parade for the Royal Marines on the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. It was pouring with rain, but, as ever, duty took priority. He took his time meeting those on parade and taking the salute as the Marines marched past to bid him farewell. His life after that was much quieter, spent mostly at the Queen's estate at Sandringham. It was there in January 2019, while he was driving himself from the estate, that he survived a serious road accident. His vehicle overturned, he was badly shaken, and he surrendered his driving licence shortly afterwards. By now he was rarely seen in public, there were occasional appearances at family occasions such as weddings, yet he remained a supportive figure to the Queen and his family. Throughout his adult life, despite the formality of his position, Philip retained his own style of doing things. He made his own uncompromising mark on national life. He once summed up his approach in characteristically forthright fashion. I've just done what I think is my best. I can't suddenly change my whole way of doing things. I can't change my interests. I can't change my the way in which uh, I react to things. It's, it's, it's part of... That's somebody's style, and, and it's too bad, it's sort of lumpy. Throughout all the monarchy's many ups and downs since the Second World War, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, the longest-serving consort in British history, was the restless outsider who put his wife and duty first. In doing so, he fulfilled his coronation oath of allegiance to Elizabeth, his queen. Their marriage and his support were the essential foundations which underpinned the success of her reign. In a speech to celebrate their golden wedding anniversary, the Queen spoke of the debt that she and the country owed him. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. The words of Her Majesty the Queen, uh, speaking a few years ago about the contribution of her husband, now her late husband, uh, Prince Philip, uh, Duke of Edinburgh, whose uh, death was announced today by Buckingham Palace uh, just over an hour ago. He was 99 due to celebrate his 100th birthday uh, within weeks, in fact. As you can imagine, uh, by now, there's lots of reaction coming into the news, many tributes being paid uh, by politicians and by leaders in communities and societies around the world. Um, let's start with the reaction um, and the, the words that have been expressed by political leaders here in the UK. Uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, has already made a statement outside Downing Street and he said that Prince Philip had earned the affection of generations of people. Uh, let's listen to the Prime Minister. It was with great sadness that a short time ago I received word from Buckingham Palace that His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh has passed away at the age of 99. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth and around the world. 
He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country to have served in the Second World War, at Cape Matapan, where he was mentioned in dispatches for bravery, and in the invasion of Sicily, where he saved his ship by his quick thinking. And from that conflict, he took an ethic of service that he applied throughout the unprecedented changes of the post-war era. Like the expert carriage driver that he was, he helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world, long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people. And at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this, and above all, for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Not just as her consort, by her side every day of her reign, but as her husband, her strength and stay of more than 70 years. And it is to Her Majesty and her family that our nation's thoughts must turn today, because they have lost not just a much loved and highly respected public figure, but a devoted husband and a proud and loving father, grandfather, and in recent years, great-grandfather. Speaking on their golden wedding anniversary, Her Majesty said that our country owed her husband a greater debt than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. And I'm sure that estimate is correct. So we mourn today with Her Majesty the Queen. We offer our condolences to her and to all her family. And we give thanks as a nation and a kingdom for the extraordinary life and work of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Prime Minister Boris Johnson at number 10 Downing Street uh, just a short while ago, uh, giving his uh, reaction to the news from Buckingham Palace that the Duke of Edinburgh has died at the age of 99 uh, and giving his own uh, appreciation really of the contribution that the Duke has made to public life uh, in the United Kingdom and beyond um, over the past uh, decades and certainly since he married uh, the Queen, Princess Elizabeth, back in 1947, over 70 years ago. We'll be hearing lots about these themes as we go along, his perception of his role, uh, which of course changed rather abruptly uh, when King George VI died and he then became um, the Royal Consort and his career in the Royal Navy came to an end soon after that. We'll be talking about his commitment to the causes of environmentalism at a time when that really was not a fashionable cause at all. And we'll be talking about his commitment to protecting the, the natural world and the Duke of Edinburgh scheme, uh, which of course has inspired millions of young people. We'll also be talking um, uh, quite openly about the fact that he was at times a very controversial figure who said some rather controversial things, in some cases upsetting some people with the frankness of his views. All of that is to come because there's lots for us to discuss. Um, we're still thinking about political reaction. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has paid this tribute to the Duke. The UK has lost an extraordinary public servant in Prince Philip. He dedicated his life to our country. And above all, I think he'll be remembered for his support and devotion to the Queen. And all of our thoughts are with the Queen, the royal family and the British public as they come together to mourn this huge loss. Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, with his words. The First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, has added her voice. She released this statement. I'm saddened by the news that the Duke of Edinburgh has died. I send my personal and deepest condolences and those of the people of Scotland to Her Majesty the Queen and to the royal family. And in Wales, the First Minister, Mark Drakeford, has also sent his condolences and expressed his sympathy he said uh, throughout his long and distinguished life, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh served the crown with selfless devotion and a generosity of spirit. We offer our sincere condolences to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. 
his children uh, and uh, their families on this sad occasion. Uh, in Northern Ireland, the First Minister there, Arlene Foster, the leader of the DUP, has sent her sympathies. Uh, and she said, as First Minister of Northern Ireland and Democratic Unionist Party leader, I offer my deepest sympathies to Her Majesty the Queen and to all members of the royal family at this sad time. So, uh, we saw the Prime Minister in Downing Street just a short while ago uh, with uh, his version of the tribute that I'm sure that we'll get from many other political leaders as well. And I'm noting that we're getting some international reaction as well coming in. I'll bring that to you uh, as soon as I can. Uh, let's go back to Downing Street. And Vicky Young is there, our deputy political editor. Um, Vicky, N Nicholas Witchell was telling us just a short while ago that, of course, over the past decade, there have been several uh, periods, really, when this news had been expected. So in that sense, it's not a great surprise. Uh, but the Prime Minister really was at pains to stress what a loss it was and indeed what a contribution the Prince Philip had made. Yeah, I think that's right. As you say, maybe not a shock, but certainly a significant moment. Just walking here, uh, the House of Commons, House of Lords aren't sitting at the moment. They're on an Easter break. And yet you could see all round Whitehall here in Downing Street as well, uh, the Union flag being lowered to half mast and then hearing those immediate tributes from across the four nations of the United Kingdom, really uh, paying their respects and, and praising the Prince for his dedication uh, to public duty. Uh, now, of course, then, uh, you get into the practicalities of what happens next. Uh, on Monday, the House of Commons will come back a, a day early uh, and they will, at half past two, uh, convene and they will have tributes and pay their tributes once again uh, to the Duke. And I think we'll see a repeat of what we saw on his 90th birthday, actually, when the Commons uh, came together. They talked about uh, his contribution, not just to his charity work, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh scheme, for example, but, of course, his uh, devotion and support for the Queen. And you always get a sense on those occasions uh, of the personality as well. So I think we'll have more anecdotes from those uh, in the political world uh, who knew him. Uh, we are, of course, in the middle of uh, election campaigns, important elections in Scotland, Wales uh, and England coming up in May. Now, so far, a number of the political parties have said out of respect to the Duke, they will suspend their campaigning. We don't know how long for, uh, but that's what uh, they have decided to do. And then, of course, behind the scenes, there will be conversations going on between the palace and the government uh, about funeral arrangements. Uh, this always happens uh, on the death of a member of the royal family. Some plans would have been uh, put in place, but the government very much takes the lead from the palace, uh, what they want, what the Duke's wishes were, and they will be talking about all of that right now. And again, we're not in normal times. The COVID pandemic, of course, means there are lots of restrictions. Government would be thinking about things like public safety if crowds were to gather. Uh, previously, when the Queen Mother died, she laid in state in Westminster Hall just over the road from here, uh, and hundreds of thousands of people came to pay their respects. Now, that seems very unlikely in the current circumstances, all of that going on behind the scenes. But the main thing really today from the politicians is them paying their respects and remembering the Duke. Indeed, Vicky. Uh, it's a day for focusing on the news, as you rightly say. Um, but given that, uh, you know, the Prime Minister has appeared and that we have uh, Downing Street making its statements, you are quite rightly pointing to the fact that uh, we're in a, coming up to a very busy political period. These things have to be factored in. Plus, of course, all the restrictions. It's no secret that there were detailed plans for a funeral. Um, so one imagines that there will be quite a lot of intense discussion between Number 10 and the palace and other royal authorities about what might now be wise and what might be practical and not practical, given what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think that is true. As you say, you know, it is no secret uh, that these things are talked about uh, in advance. Now, my understanding from some in government uh, who were privy to some of the talks was that the Duke of Edinburgh always wanted uh, a low-key funeral. Uh, now, what happens with the government is that if there is, for example, uh, military pageantry, all that kind of thing, that's when the government would get involved. But I think, as you say, this is uh, very different. You know, there are strict rules in place, I think, from Monday for funerals for everybody uh, in England. Uh, only 30 people, only 30 mourners can gather to that together. It's obviously um, a, a difficult time for families uh, who are bereaved. Now, that all of that will have to be taken into consideration. 
Uh, we know that the Queen is at uh, Windsor, and so I think the possibility of a private funeral uh, is, is there, and you would never have thought of that before. But as you say, we can go back to the Queen Mother uh, when she died. It was a, a very different moment. I remember uh, when she was lying in state in Westminster Hall, seeing the crowds of people who filed past other members of the royal family uh, came and stood uh, beside her coffin. You just cannot imagine that kind of thing uh, happening in the current pandemic situation. Vicky, many thanks. We'll talk to you again later. Vicky Young, our deputy political editor. Uh, the time is 1.33 here in the United Kingdom. And, of course, to viewers who are watching us across the world, uh, welcome to this uh, special BBC coverage uh, of the death of his Royal uh, Highness um, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, who's died at the age of 99. Uh, and uh, the statement which came from Buckingham Palace uh, about an hour and a half ago said this. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, uh, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. And further announcements will be made in due course. The royal family joined with people around the world in mourning his loss. Uh, still with me is our royal correspondent, uh, Nicholas Witchell, who's monitoring lots of the reaction, Nick. And indeed, um, lots of viewers will be latching on to that statement, the statement of personal loss for the Queen, and then the little add-on at the end about further announcements in due course. What can you say to help viewers with that part of the statement? Two words, initially, no fuss in terms of uh, the funeral arrangements. Just picking up the discussion that you were having with uh, Vicky a moment ago, it's all been worked out. I mean, again, it's no secret that, of course, there is a, a master plan for all of this. And no fuss is what he wanted for his funeral. That is what he will get. Um, it will be focused on Windsor, um, I, and we will get full details uh, over the next few days. And I think the fact that he wanted and said, I don't want a great fuss... Um, is a measure and a reflection of his pragmatic approach to life. Um, always adaptable, always self-reliant, always commonsensical, actually. And, of course, he had to be self-reliant when you consider his disrupted and rootless childhood, banished from Greece when he was just a baby, being brought up uh, in a divided and a, and a disrupted family, coming to this country, and the United Kingdom becoming his, ad his adopted nation, and uh, a nation that, of course, he has served, both in the Royal Navy, in which he could have gone far. I mean, he was a man of, of considerable potential in terms of uh, the ability to command and inspire, and it was those natural reflexes that he then had to adapt into the role that he found for himself. Um, and in terms of the relationship with the Queen, you know, it, w it, it, it was so important to her. She was absolutely devoted to him. And as I was saying earlier, this reign has, in more ways than perhaps are appreciated, it has been a partnership, a team effort, a partnership at the apex of our society here in the United Kingdom. And he has made, I think it's right to say, an incalculable contribution to the success of that reign. Um, so, yes, he has discharged his duty. It's interesting for lots of people, Nick, I think, especially those who are younger, who are not familiar with the whole story, for you to be reminding us that his childhood was a very difficult one, a disrupted one. Um, and for those whose knowledge of those events in the royal family may be actually confined to things like The Crown on television, where they've revisited the story, uh, to realise that when he married into the family, there were people around who thought that actually he wasn't uh, the kind of person who was ideally suited. I mean, that kind of turbulence today is almost forgotten. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the courtiers and some members of the royal family were extremely suspicious of him. Um, the Queen, as Princess Elizabeth, uh, fell in love during the war and immediately after the war they became engaged in 1947 and they, in, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. And you've got to sort of put it in that context. So it was, as Winston Churchill said, a flash of colour in the grey life uh, of those post-war years. But there is no doubt that the courtiers, and particularly then when she became Queen unexpectedly with the death of George VI, when she became Queen in 1952 at the age of just 25, yeah that the courtiers wanted to control this new young monarch, wanted to be sure that she would be compliant. Well, of course, she was, because that's her natural personality. Her character was to fall into line and to 
pursue her reign very much in the style of her father. I mean, it's been a continuation, really, of the reign of George VI. But courtiers saw in this young Prince Philip, or he wasn't Prince Philip at that point, he was the Duke of Edinburgh, um, not a compliant character, a strong and forceful personality. Now, that, I think, explains much of of, of the attraction between the Queen and Philip, Opposite personalities, she very conservative with a small c, cautious, shy, he brimming with self-confidence, brimming with ideas, iconoclastic approach to things. But, of course, that didn't set well no. with the courtiers, no. with, with, with those charged with steering the monarchy in the 1950s. And he had a very difficult time. I mean, people said they were bloody to him right. because they, they sought to exclude him, yeah. they sought to control him. And with a man of his instincts... Uh, powerful, you know, a strong, vital, uh, commanding personality, he found that enormously difficult. He fought back, though. He did, as best he could, but in the end he had to kind of give way and accept that there was never any question of him having a constitutional role. He was never made Prince Consort in the way that uh, Prince Albert was alongside Queen Victoria. And he then, as we've been saying, had to find a role for himself. And slowly but surely, in the 1950s, he adapted to that. And you've got to remember, this is a man, or was a man, with, with a keen intellect, a, 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 a sharp intellectual curiosity. And he adapted that towards areas of interest to him. We've talked about the environment. And he was a pioneer in that respect. I see that Tony Blair, former British Prime Minister, has just said he was often way ahead of his time in protection of the environment and reconciliation between the faiths. He was one of the leading figures in setting up what are called the Windsor Conferences. So, again, in, in so many aspects of life that we now take for granted that the royal family are involved with, that Prince Charles, environment, faith matters and so on. It was actually his father, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, who pioneered the way in in those avenues of our national life, quite apart, of course, from the Duke of Edinburgh's award, which I see is now active in 130 countries and something like 7 million participants around the world have benefited from the programme that he set up in the 1950s. Again, the courtiers were suspicious of it. They wondered, what is this man trying to set up? What is this Duke of Edinburgh's award going to be? You know, what are they going to do? What, what's it going to do to our young people? But, of course, it has been just a, a force for power and positive energy in young people, giving them an opportunity. So, yes, I mean, he, he, he found all these different ways yeah. to make a real contribution in his own right. Nick, those are the themes that, uh, thank you for them, um, that I now want to develop because um, just to remind people in public, of course, when appearing with the Queen, Duke of Edinburgh always fulfilled the duties of royal consort, uh, taking second place to Her Majesty. But um, as our royal correspondent Sarah Campbell now explains, behind closed doors, the Duke, as Nick was saying, uh, exercised immense influence uh, on the life of the royal family and drove many of its key decisions and reforms. Great roar from the crowd outside Buckingham Palace. While the Queen took centre stage in public life, when it came to family matters, it was Prince Philip who was in charge. When Elizabeth came to the throne, Philip had to leave the Navy. It was unusual in the 1950s and 60s for the man of the household to give up his career to support his wife and children but he had little choice but to fit his life around her unique position. And, as their home movies show, he did so with gusto. First-hand accounts that I've been told by people who were there at the time of Prince Philip not just bathing the children, playing with the children, but reading to the children. He was a hands-on dad. His was an unusual childhood, split up from his parents and his four sisters, one of whom was tragically killed. The pleasures of family life are enjoyed by the baby's mother and father less frequently than by ordinary parents. Royal duties involved frequent foreign travel, but as Philip's family grew, he was determined to do things differently. I always aim to be home during the holidays anyway, so that I can see the children. I mean, we try and keep the children out of the public eye, largely so that they can grow up as normally as possible. What's this for? In 1969, Philip allowed the TV cameras in for a behind-the-scenes documentary. This was the royal family, as never seen before or since, reportedly on the instruction of the Queen. Decisions such as schooling were his. Gordonston, the Scottish boarding school, had suited Philip as a youngster, and so that's where he chose to send his sons. 
while in later life, Prince Charles praised the school's ethos. His years there, far from home, were difficult. Prince Charles has his memories, and that when it comes to Prince Philip's motives in what he was doing as a father, it was to try to toughen up his son, to correct what he perceived as, as weaknesses. I suppose, ultimately, to perhaps to recreate the self-reliant, self-confident boy that um, Philip was turned into by the Gordonston system. Father and son did come to share common ground, however. The Duke passed on his love of painting and a passion for the environment and conservation. His relationship with his other children was more straightforward. The bond with Princess Anne was clear. Alike in many ways, she was outspoken and she knew how to deal with her father's similarly frank manner. He shared a naval background with Prince Andrew, both having served in fields of conflict. And he may have been disappointed when Prince Edward chose to leave the Royal Marines, but over the years, their relationship grew ever closer. It was to his youngest son that Philip entrusted perhaps his greatest legacy, the Duke of Edinburgh's award. What's it like working with your father? He doesn't, don't worry. <laughs> it's very easy. He does his own thing. <laughs> and now the veil is thrown back and we can see the Princess of Wales. There were difficult years when the marriages of three of his four children failed, the most public, the split of Charles and Diana. What emerged much later, to the surprise of some, was the extent to which he tried to help. During the breakup, he'd written to his daughter-in-law and the tone of his letters and her replies revealed a softer, compassionate side to the Duke rarely seen in public. Dearest Pa, she wrote in 1992, that she was pleased to receive his letter and particularly so to read that he was desperately anxious to help. He replied, if invited, he would always do his utmost to help, but was quite ready to concede that he had no talents as a marriage counsellor. There was no doubt on her part that um, gruff and stern though Philip um, could often be, that his, his motives were of the best and she appreciated that. Into his 90s, public engagements became fewer, but family events like Princess Charlotte's christening remained a priority. In 2018, despite a recent hip replacement, he walked unaided into the chapel for his grandson Harry's wedding. Two years later, isolating at Windsor, he was there for his granddaughter Beatrice. A heavy programme of official engagements prevents the Princess and the Duke from seeing their son as often as they wish. It is only on occasions like this that they can enjoy the happiness of parenthood. It was a long life where duty and family responsibility often came into conflict. The pandemic, as has been the case for so many families, deprived his loved ones of direct contact with him in his final months. His diminishing influence as the family patriarch coincided with a time of great public and private upset for the family. Perhaps the Duke's steadying influence and forthright manner were missed. His children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be united in mourning his loss. Just a sense there of the uh, influence over many decades that the Duke of Edinburgh has exercised, certainly within the royal family, and uh, everyone saying today, really, everyone who knows the picture inside the palace, the various royal palaces, that the influence has been probably underestimated over the years uh, because people have been rather discreet about the level of the Duke's influence over some very key decisions. Though, of course, we know that uh, as far back as the 50s and 60s, uh, after he joined the royal family, he believed it was a, an institution that was in desperate need of modernisation. And he felt that it was his duty, really, to try to drag that institution into the 20th century. And uh, as Nicholas Witchell was telling us earlier on, there were plenty of people within the institution who were rather suspicious and uh, indeed hostile in some cases uh, to the efforts that the Duke was trying to make. So we'll talk a little more about that as the day goes on, because there are lots of different aspects to that influence. Um, more reaction coming in. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, uh, has released this statement. 
Uh, His Grace says, I join with the rest of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in mourning the loss of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and give thanks to God for his extraordinary life of dedicated service. He consistently put the interests of others ahead of his own, and in doing so, uh, provided an outstanding example of Christian service. Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the... Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mervis has released his own statement and in it he says, on behalf of the Jewish communities of the Commonwealth, I send our most profound condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and to the Royal Family on the passing of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. So lots of the focus today is on Windsor Castle because Windsor Castle is where Uh, The Duke passed away this morning. It's where the Queen has, of course, been uh, spending many, many months during the pandemic. They've both been there uh, for a long time together, shielding, um, and uh, during that period of great vulnerability, the Queen normally, of course, would have spent far more time at Buckingham Palace. Let's have a look today at the scene in central London, um, and we see the flags at half-mast. Queen not in residence, as I've said. She's at Windsor Castle still. But this, of course, is seen as... The headquarters. This is the uh, the shop window in many ways of the royal family uh, across the world. Buckingham Palace is that statement to the world of the presence of the royal family in London. And that famous balcony is where we've seen them gather on so many occasions and where indeed we've seen the Duke gather on so many occasions very close to his birthday in June when we have the Queen's birthday parade and the family appears on the balcony there in early June. So at Buckingham Palace for us is our royal correspondent, uh, Sarah Campbell. Um, Sarah, uh, It's uh, clearly a nice, bright, sunny day there. I can see some people gathering behind you. Not many, it has to be said. Probably lots of people are aware that uh, the news this morning came from Windsor. It didn't come from Buckingham Palace. Mm. But talk us through the statement as you saw it and maybe some of the questions raised by it for uh, for the days and weeks ahead. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, as you say, I mean, it's, it is, of course, the, the Easter holidays. People are here, perhaps, in a way that they, they haven't been so much recently. But um, you talk about the fact that there will be a focus on Windsor Castle. But as you say, Buckingham Palace, the London home of the royal family, the London home of Prince Philip for so many years. And so it's perhaps not surprising that uh, this is where people uh, will, will associate with, will perhaps come down to, to express their thoughts, express their condolences. Um, Um, And that is actually going to be an issue, I think, over the next few days. There was, when I arrived, the notice of condolence uh, was on the railings, uh, as is tradition. Um, Normally that would have been placed there for 24 hours, but actually it's already been taken down. And I think that's, that's, that's something that will impact over the next few days. Of course, we are in a pandemic and it has been made very clear that, uh, that crowds, any kind of issue, any kind of um, event which might draw crowds simply won't happen. And so the emphasis will be on remembering the Duke, which people will want to do, but to do it privately and not to gather together. Um, and if you sort of wanted any evidence, if you like, that Prince Philip wasn't just a a British figure, then I can tell you that to my left and to my right, there are around 30 to 40 uh, news broadcasters from across the world. And I think that reflects very much that Prince Philip was very much an international figure. I mean, for for so many decades, possibly one of the most famous British figures around the world. Of course, the link with the Commonwealth uh, extremely strong. And so it's it's not surprising that, that this is where people are choosing to gather. The flag flying at half mast, as you say, on Buckingham Palace. And um, I was just reflecting, you say that the weather is very nice here today. The last time I saw Prince Philip here was on the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. It was for his last ever engagement. That was back in August 2017. It was an event uh, involving the Royal Marines. It was chucking it down with rain. It was freezing, uh, but he was in his late 90s. And I think as sort of as evidence of his stoicism, everyone else was freezing, wanted to get inside. But, you know, he was doing it at his own pace. It was clearly quite an emotional time for him. I think there was a bit of a, a glint, a tear in his eyes. He sort of said goodbye to public life in August 2017. But it, uh, it is incredible, isn't it? Saying goodbye to public life, retiring when you're 96. Uh, it, it is indeed, Sarah. Um, 
The other thing I wanted to raise with you was this, really. We've had the statement which, of course, expressed uh, the Queen's sadness at losing a husband of more than 70 years, and it referred in general terms to the royal family. Would you expect other members of the family individually to be releasing their own statements after this, or do you think that that's the one statement that the family wants to be going around the world today? I think my understanding is that is the statement that will be issued today and we won't we don't we shouldn't expect to hear from any other member of the royal family today um, of course notably mentioning the queen it's it is it is worth going back and remembering isn't it that this was her partner, she called him her strength and her stay for decades, for longer than most of us have been alive. And so it is right, I think, that it's, it is the Queen's and thoughts are with the Queen throughout this time. I mentioned a little bit earlier the sort of limitations that COVID might bring in, in the coming days. And I think it's also worth reflecting that the rest of the family, um, in a way that thousands of families uh, across the country uh, ha will have experienced over the last few months, will have been deprived of direct contact with Prince Philip over what has turned out to be his final months. And I'm sure that's going to be a huge sadness, I think, for his children, his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren, because as, as we were hearing, he really was the patriarch of the family. If the Queen was the centre stage in public, he really was the, the, the sort of head of the family behind the scenes, um, but in a way that so many families will be able to empathise with. They just haven't been able to see him in person. I think it was Prince Charles uh, noted sometime before Christmas that they'd been doing, you know, online calls, Zoom calls, but it's not quite the same as being able to give someone a hug. Um, and so I think that, that will be an added element of sadness today. Indeed, Sarah, and that's, I think, a very, very important point to raise, which is that, um, you know, as some people see the family as being rather remote in their view, that's an experience that they do have in common with many millions of people, not just in the UK, but around the world. And that is the difficulty of being together at a family, especially at a time like this, when families, of course, traditionally and naturally would like to be together to grieve and to talk and to reflect on what's happened. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, the, the, the irony, perhaps, is that on the other side, um, I mean, since uh, the Duke retired, as they say, in August 2017, he's actually spent quite a lot of time in Sandringham at a, a little cottage on the Sandringham estate. And obviously, because the Queen has continued in her role, she has been spending time in Windsor and London, obviously, before lockdown. And actually, during lockdown, ironically, would have brought them together and perhaps they would have spent more time together over the last year than perhaps they otherwise would have done. So a nice thought there that perhaps the Queen and Prince Philip had many, many hours to reflect on, well, the extraordinary things that they've seen and experienced together over the last seven or so decades. Sarah, thanks very much. We'll talk to you again later, I've no doubt, but thanks a lot for now. Sarah Campbell, our Royal Correspondent there, um, outside Buckingham Palace. Um, and just to emphasise again, uh, Sarah there outside Buckingham Palace, because, of course, that is the uh, global symbol of the royal family's presence in London, but the Queen today uh, at Windsor, as she has been for many months, and that is in fact where, uh, as I was reporting earlier, that is where the Duke of Edinburgh passed away this morning, and the announcement made at around midday uh, by the palace. We're talking about influence. We're also talking about contribution, um, a very wide range of elements of contributions that the Duke made in public life uh, over many decades in this country. And we've discussed some of the initiatives. Uh, one of the Prince's greatest contributions to public life, without question, uh, was that award scheme that he established back in the 1950s, in, in 1956, the Duke of Edinburgh's Award. Um, and many millions of people around the world will know exactly all about this because lots will have done it themselves at school. Uh, at the time, the scheme was seen as very radical. It was seen as very pioneering. and. Uh, it encouraged young people to explore new challenges, to take risks uh, and to show their own initiative. And as our correspondent Elaine Dunkley reports, the scheme has enriched the lives of millions of young people, uh, even during this pandemic. The Duke of Edinburgh's Award. Activities, expeditions and adventures. For millions of people, it has been part of growing up. It aims to give young people from all backgrounds a sense of achievement outside of the classroom through field trips and volunteering. <laughs> How many times do you think you got lost? For these pupils at secondary school in the heart of Manchester, the experience has been life-changing. 
like when you go on Duke of Edinburgh it's just a whole different environment it's like green everywhere like as far as you can see even signing up for it was a bit of, out of my comfort zone because prior to it I was quite shy and reserved and didn't really talk to many people in my year I've been working for a charity shop near in my community and I think definitely it's been it's been a very interesting you look, get to meet lots of new people it gets touched lots of interesting people hear their story had fun and made so many friends without like I don't know how I'd have gotten through my high school years honestly it's really really good it began in 1956 and grew out of the Duke's own experiences at Gordonston the awards ethos was rooted in the philosophy of the school's headmaster Kurt Hahn who felt that education should be about more than just academic achievement it was based on Hahn's theory that you shouldn't be a specialist in any one thing and and he felt that the that you shouldn't concentrate entirely on academic education. No, no, His right. idea, philosophy That's was that if you could get young people to succeed in any area of activity, that mere sensation of success would spread over into a lot of others. When the scheme first started, it was considered quite revolutionary, but it also had its detractors. I think a lot of organisations thought it was going to be a rival. The scouts, the guides, Outward Bound Trust, all kinds of people thought, oh dear, here comes another youth organisation to rival us. The cleverness was that it was a programme which was complementary and not competitive, so anyone could do it. The programme has moved with the times. It started as a boys-only group, and even when girls joined, there was a gender divide. Can you tell me how you'll be able to get instructors and, adju and adjudicators to teach things like marriage and makeup and all the other new schemes you've mentioned in the pamphlet. Oh, makeup we've got no problem. Marriage might be a bit more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> From helping at food banks to vaccination centres, during the pandemic, many young people have volunteered through the scheme. Are you here for the vaccine, madam? All right. I think the Duke of Edinburgh is fantastic to gain, especially independence. Everyone can do it. That's, everyone's helping the community. Everyone's being active. Everyone's learning a new skill. And I think the inclusion of the general, the youth, is fantastic. OK, guys, ready to go? Throughout the decades, the awards have been based on physical activity, skills, okay. service and cool. expedition. Right, what you choose to do in each category is almost unlimited. Then there are three levels, gold, silver and bronze. It's his vision and energy that created the organisation that enables many, many young people to be able to access these development opportunities. And he was an absolute sort of stalwart champion for young people's sort of opportunities and development right the way through until, until he retired. Uh, while this is a, you know, and it's an incredibly sort of sad moment to reflect um, on his passing, um, we are incredibly optimistic about the fact that we can build on his incredible legacy and uh, the award will, will still be going strong many, many years uh, from now. Its popularity and success has spread across the globe, with more than 140 countries taking part. The scheme that bears his name will perhaps be his greatest legacy, a testament to the ideas and outlook of the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, again, just looking at uh, one of the important elements of the Duke's contribution over the years, the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, which of course has benefited many millions of young people, now adults, many of them around the world, who can remember uh, the lessons they learnt, not just in terms of uh, the physical challenges of the award scheme, but of course the uh, mental challenges too, uh, pushing the boundaries and uh, developing skills in terms of character and personality, a, a very worthwhile scheme indeed, as everyone acknowledges. Uh, there's some more reaction coming in. International leaders have been paying tribute as well. This from the European Union, or from the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, she says, I'm saddened to hear of the passing of His Royal Highness Prince Philip. I would like to extend my sincere sympathy to Her Majesty the Queen, the Royal Family, and the people of the United Kingdom on this very sad day. Uh, from Dublin as well, we have the Taoiseach, the Irish uh, Premier, uh, Michael Martin, saying, I'm saddened to hear of the death of His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Our thoughts and prayers are with Queen Elizabeth and the people of the UK at this time. From India, uh, the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, has released uh, these words. He said, my thoughts are with the British people and the royal family on the passing of uh, His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. He had a distinguished career in the military 
and was at the forefront of many community service initiatives, may his soul rest in peace. We also have some reaction from New Zealand. The Prime Minister of New Zealand has expressed her condolences. Jacinda Ardern said, Our thoughts are with Her Majesty the Queen at this profoundly sad time. And on behalf of the New Zealand people and government, I would like to express my sincere condolences to Her Majesty and to all the royal family. So just a few minutes ago, we were talking to my colleague Sarah at Buckingham Palace, but we were saying that the focus today, because of where... Her Majesty the Queen is, um, and because of where the Duke passed away, is indeed Windsor Castle. Um, and that is where we're going to join our correspondent, uh, Helena Wilkinson. Uh, Helena, we can see just a few people behind you there. Of course, the restrictions are still in force. You wouldn't be expecting big crowds anywhere today, in all fairness. Um, but what are you picking up there? And um, I'm just thinking about Windsor itself as a symbol of not the headquarters of the royal family, but very much the home and the, the favoured home, really, of the Duke and the Queen. Yes, that's absolutely uh, right, Hugh. The Royal Standard is flying here at Windsor Castle, uh, meaning the Queen is, of course, here in residence. Uh, but as the news rippled through what is a royal town uh, here in Windsor, people did start to gather. As you mentioned there, we are still under uh, COVID restrictions, but I don't think it's surprising that some people, mainly local people, have wanted to come out here to Windsor uh, to pay their respects and reflect on what it was a remarkable life of the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, I don't know if you can see just behind us in the distance over there, some flowers have started, uh, people have started to leave uh, bouquets of flowers. Uh, a little girl and a little boy left some earlier on. One of the cards on the flowers uh, reads, rest in peace, Prince Philip. Another one reads, uh, deepest condolences to Her Majesty the Queen. And if we show you just a bit further down, Hugh, you can see uh, primarily the media that have gathered here. Uh, but in the distance, you might be able to see, uh, I would say, dozens of people who have gathered. But there is a police presence here uh, trying to keep people at a social distance. But as you say, Windsor, of course, uh, a town which is used to many royal events over the years. Uh, but today here, a not unexpected sombre mood here uh, in Windsor, here outside the castle where uh, people have gathered. And of course, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh uh, had been isolating together here for much of the last year since the a coronavirus pandemic began to unravel. The Queen initially came here to Windsor Castle uh, and the Duke then joined her. And they spent uh, quite a lot of time here together, much more so than in recent years. They were with a small household staff uh, in a small bubble. They celebrated, of course, the Duke's 99th birthday here at Windsor Castle last year. You may recall that photograph of the couple uh, looking very happy in the sunshine on the Duke's birthday last year. They also celebrated uh, quietly their 73rd uh, wedding anniversary last year. But of course, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, just two months off his 100th birthday, and it was a birthday that no doubt he would have been determined to reach. It would have been a, a time when perhaps the royal family would have been able to gather uh, here at Windsor Castle. But I think thoughts here today in Windsor uh, go to the Queen, Her Majesty the Queen, who has lost her husband. Uh, I think for her, though, there will be some comfort or she will take some comfort from the flowers that have been left here and the outpouring of grief, perhaps not the crowds that we would have been used to if we weren't under COVID restrictions, but still some people have gathered. Uh, and an indication as well, Hugh, of the appeal of the Duke of Edinburgh, all ages. A little girl walked past us. She must have been about eight years old uh, a bit earlier on and just said, it's so sad, it's so sad. So the focus really here this afternoon on hearing the news of the death of the Duke of Edinburgh here at Windsor, uh, where people have gathered and they've been laying flowers uh, to pay their respects and reflect on the life of the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, Helena, thank you very much. We'll talk to you again later on, um, but thanks for the latest uh, 
there at Windsor, at Windsor Castle. Nicholas Witchell, our Royal Correspondent, is still with me. Um, Nick, what do you make of uh, what's being said right now? Well, just a little bit of guidance from Buckingham Palace. They are understandably very anxious to avoid doing anything or encouraging anything which leads to crowds gathering. They are actually discouraging people from leaving flowers because that brings people together. They encourage people instead to perhaps go on to the online books of condolence uh, uh, or they are encouraged to donate to charities of their own choice mm. or charities that uh, are known to have been popular and close to the Duke's heart. So things like environmental charities, um, the uh, Duke of Edinburgh's award, obviously, the National Playing Fields Association. He was president of that for 64 years. He became involved because he was appalled to see young children playing in the street in big cities in the 1950s. He wanted green spaces so that they could enjoy an outdoor uh, recreational activities, and he became very involved in that. They paid tribute to his tireless efforts over the years. So I think in the next few days we will see that the focus will be very much on Windsor as I was saying earlier no fuss uh, but of course we will see the royal family coming together and we will I'm sure see Prince Harry yes. returning to this country for his grandfather's funeral. Indeed Nick thank you very much for now. Um, by his own admission uh, Prince Philip's years in the Royal Navy which uh, Nick told us about uh, a short while ago uh, were immensely important in forming his character and throughout his life he maintained the outlook and the bearing uh, of a naval officer. As a midshipman, he was mentioned in dispatches for his bravery under fire. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, made reference to that in his statement earlier. And later, when royal duties replaced uh, that naval career, he worked to keep Britain's maritime history very much alive. Now, my colleague Rita Chakrabarti looks back at the Duke's close relationship with the Royal Navy. Navy and life at sea were a huge part of the Duke of Edinburgh's career. It had been a British destroyer that had taken him, as a toddler, into exile from his native Greece. Two of his sons were naval officers, Prince Charles and Prince Andrew, taking up where he'd left off after his wife became Queen. Prince Philip joined the Navy straight from school. As a cadet, he first met Princess Elizabeth in 1939, when she visited Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth with her parents. Active service came during World War II in 1940, as a midshipman on the old battleship HMS Ramillies. Years later, he reflected on life as a sailor. You're exposed to the elements in a, in a way which are not ashore in any time because you're, you've got your feet on, on the earth, as it were, and uh, you've got some sort of um, security of shelter and so on. Whereas at sea, you're in a cockle shell in this enormous expanse of the ocean. So that tends to cut you down to size a bit. In 1941, Philip joined HMS Valiant, operating in some danger in the Mediterranean. During the Battle of Cape Matapan, he earned a mention in dispatches for directing searchlights onto enemy cruisers. We were hit by uh, two bombs. The, the whole ship bent like that with the explosions and, and actually bent sufficiently for some of the hatches down below to be jammed. So several people rang up and said, please, can you get a tin opener? We'd like to get out, you know. Promotion followed and a posting to a destroyer on hazardous convoy duty in the North Sea before he returned to the Mediterranean in support of the Allied invasion of Sicily. At the end of the war, he was in Tokyo Bay to witness the surrender of Japanese forces. After his marriage, he studied at the Royal Naval College in Greenwich and was posted to Malta, where Princess Elizabeth joined him as an officer's wife. It was clearly a happy time for them both. In 1950, Philip was given his first command, the frigate HMS Magpie. But his active naval career ended two years later when the Queen succeeded to the throne. He accepted this momentous change in his life and simply got on with the job. But his contemporaries always believed that he could have achieved high rank. I remember Lord Mountbatten talking to me when I was first Sea Lord. Uh, and he said, of course, if Philip had stayed in the Navy, there would have been great competition between you. I don't think the competition would have been very strong, actually. He would have got it. Do you think so? Oh, yes. Royal duties were now his first priority. But the Duke maintained his interest in Britain's maritime heritage. 
And on the 50th anniversary of the end of the war, he was quick to leave the royal podium to march alongside his old comrades. The old comrades that he was very loyal to, uh, right to the end, it has to be said. Um, more reaction and tributes coming in. The First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, um, I brought you a statement earlier, but uh, the First Minister has now uh, delivered her own statement, and this is what she said. I'm deeply saddened by the news that the Duke of Edinburgh has died and my deepest personal condolences go to Her Majesty the Queen and the entire royal family. First and foremost, he was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather and my thoughts are with all of those today who will be feeling a profound sense of loss and grief. In particular, the Queen. Uh, he was her husband of 74 years and uh, I think we can all imagine uh, just how devastated she will be at his loss. Uh, Prince Philip, though, he lived a life of public service and deep devotion to the Queen. He had a close association, of course, with Scotland. He went to school in Scotland. Uh, I know uh, that he enjoyed all of the time he spent at Balmoral. He had a very long association as Chancellor with the University of Edinburgh. But probably above all of that, the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme transformed the lives and gave hope and inspiration to countless numbers of young people. So I think uh, we should deeply appreciate the massive contribution that he made to public life and to the whole country. The statement issued uh, by uh, the Scottish Government and, of course, uh, the First Minister there expressing her condolences to the Royal Family, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland. Let's just recap on the two um, other statements I gave you a short while ago. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, uh, released this statement. He said, I join with the rest of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in mourning the loss of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and give thanks to God for his extraordinary life of dedicated service. He consistently put the interests of others ahead of his own, and in so doing provided an outstanding example of Christian service. We had it from the uh, Chief Rabbi, Ephraim Mervis, who released this statement, and he said, um, on behalf of the Jewish communities of the Commonwealth, I send our most profound condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and the Royal Family on the passing of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, so with those tributes in mind and the one from the Archbishop of Canterbury, I'm delighted to say that uh, uh, we are honoured to be joined by Dr John Sentamu, the uh, former Archbishop of York, uh, who joins us now from berwick upon tweed Dr Sentamu, thank you so much for giving your time to us today. It's a delight and a joy here to be able to, uh, to talk to you and... Um... I trust you had a good Easter, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, and we know how important Easter is to the community, so thank you for that. Um, I'm just wondering, from your point of view, when someone dies at the age of 99, who's had a long and eventful life, who's had many health problems, clearly there is little element of surprise, though there is an element of shock. Um, how did you respond to this news? I, I, I was hoping he would live to 100 uh, he, uh, the Duke and I, were born on the 10th of June, though not in the same year. So we've been sparring partners in terms, of, in terms of being born on the 10th of June. So I was hoping that he will reach 100 and I'll be given the opportunity to say some words about him in the House of Lords. And uh, because when he turned 95 and, um, and 90 and 95, I was the person speaking on behalf of the Lord Spiritual about uh, the life he has actually led. And so for me, I just feel that Her Majesty the Queen would also have found this a very difficult uh, moment, but knowing him and knowing her, uh, they would want more prayers, more support and more encouragement. So I, I was taken aback because I was preparing my sort of speech I'll give in uh, thanksgiving and gratitude when he reached 100. Um, I'm just wondering what your impression of him was as a man. Um, I encountered him, first of all, when I was Vic of Tarsil, when he came to give uh, the Duke of Edinburgh awards to girls in St Martin's School, which was next to the vicarage. And then I encountered him uh, when I went to uh, Sandringham to preach at Easter. And at the end of this service, lunchtime, he would really quiz you about the things you said. I was preaching about Jesus turning water into wine. And, and he, he had a curiosity of a mind, wanting to know, and would not just take things for granted. 
Um, and also, uh, then, of course, when we, Margaret and I, had the joy on the Queen's birthdays, uh, being invited to stay um, at Windsor Castle, and we met him on numerous occasions. And one night, actually, he and the Queen taking us around the restored chapel, and with his typical sense of humor, um, showed me a piece of wood and said, now, this is my uh, avant-garde art. Um, and I was admiring it and wanting to know how he saved it. And the big laugh, he said, that's a piece of wood I saved from the fire. <laughs> 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 you know, I was really taken and I was saying, how wonderful, the work is done. He said, oh, no, no, no. And, yeah. um, and I think for him, I've never spoken to him or anybody without really smiling. There's always a smile on his face. And occasionally you can see a mischief about to arise. And um, he's the greatest tease, actually, I've actually known. So as a man, I would say that he was very solid. He loved humor and he loved teasing people and he loved speaking his mind. So I, I think I got really very fond of him. And of course, the same with Her Majesty the Queen, that when they are with you, and they're talking to you, you are the only person that matters in the room. They're not like other people looking around or scanning the room to see where the best conversation is going to come from. So I am going to miss greatly my sparring partner, and I just hope you will allow me to do what he would have expected and what Hamages would expect to say a little bit of the prayer that is prayed in the Church of England every day for the Queen. And it goes like this Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we most heartily. We beseech thee with thy favor to behold our most gracious sovereign lady, sovereign, sovereign lady Queen Elizabeth, and so replenish her with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that she may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue her plenteously with heavenly gifts, strengthen her, and finally, after this life, she may attain everlasting joy and felicity through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the prayers have been always said, and the same would have been true about the royal family, which I say daily, and I'm hoping that we all unite in offering this prayer for somebody who's really been a great servant uh, of this nation, of the Commonwealth, and particularly towards young people with his wonderful award. Um, so he's a man that, for me, I almost i am going to be missing a, a brother. Oh. I'm going to miss somebody who had this amazing sense of humor uh, but also always standing behind the queen, supporting her, encouraging her. And you could see, you could see it. And the number of times we've met actually tells me here is a great example of de devotion, commitment, love, cheerfulness. And whenever there were tragedies, you could be sure that he would actually deeply feel them. Uh, and then one word I would say finally, when he had that first operation in Papua Hospital, putting a stent in his heart, on midnight, I was taking a communion service in York Minster using the 1662 prayer book. And I didn't know he was going to be listening. Uh, apparently, he asked for a radio at midnight because he thought there's always a service being broadcast. And I had a wonderful card from him. Thank you for a beautiful communion service. And using the words that I know, and I didn't need a book. <laughs> <laughs> again, uh, John, again, you know, you underline the sense of humour. But yeah. in introducing that prayer and the element of faith, can I ask you yeah. this very directly? Was, was, yeah. was he a man whose faith was unquestioning? Did he just accept it in an unquestioning way? Or did he have, I mean, because, you know, there have been things written about the fact that at some stages in life he's questioned his faith. What was your sense of his faith and how robust was it? I would say it was very robust. Um, there is an Archbishop of Can Canterbury, Anselm, who said, faith is always seeking understanding. And he was not prepared to simply take things on blind faith. He didn't want that. He didn't. And I was very grateful. I mean, that thing about the, the turning water into wine, he asked me, do you think what Jesus did is what you, you regretted did in bending spoons and knives? Is that, is that such sort of hypnosis? Now, that doesn't mean he doubted the story, but he wanted to know whether I, who's been preaching in the, in the church in Sandringham, have a, a reason to explain it. And we had a wonderful nearly an hour and a half of conversation. And it only came to an end when Her Majesty the Queen said, 
Philip, Philip and his theories. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he, 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 for me, I never found a single doubt in his belief in the death and resurrection of Christ and that the church really wants to invite people into love. What he didn't go for is a sort of naive, never questioning. And I think that to question and have a lot of questions and a lot of doubts sometimes is the only way you're going to come to a real robust face. I found him that he does what I used to do um, as, a, as a little child, constantly asking questions in order that I may gain understanding. And what I didn't understand to know that there may be a day when I'll understand, but at the moment, what I understand keeps me going. So him, people say he was interested in spirituality. He was willing to explore anything. Why? Because his feet were firmly rooted in Christ. And therefore, he never saw it as a problem to uh, admire people of other faith, uh, engage them in the way they understood things, and not imposing his wills and understanding on others, because he had his feet strongly, strongly on the ground. I mean, I remember one day saying to him, why, you know, you, you go into all over the place, what is that? He said, haven't you realized when birds fly, they fly with their feet pointing to the ground. That's why they're able to take off and land safely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there was this amazing, amazing exploration. And actually, for because of his robustness of understanding, he was able to explore. When, for example, you talked to him about the, the environment and why he was so keen about the environment, he would say, anybody looking around would see, really, clearly quoting those words of Gerard Manley Hopkins, that the, you know, the universe is charged with the grandeur of God. If it is, why aren't we looking at it with great care and great caution, like we will look at, after our cathedrals? If the whole universe is charged with the, um, the, the grandeur of God, it means we've got to take more care about the environment. And you remember there's that tribe in the in Solomon Islands that um, we're calling him their God and they pin him up. And I said, what do you feel about you being called a God? <laughs> and he said to me, well, have you ever seen, have you ever seen um, a God in human flesh like you apart from Christ? So when they called me a God, I cannot be a God. I can't be. And if you want to say to me, you can become their God. <laughs> 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 Again, this tremendous, robust um, sort of conversation, yeah. and I am going to I am going to miss him terribly because every conversation I had with him was always challenging. You had to be certain about what you believed, and what you didn't, you said to him, uh, "I'm sorry, that answer doesn't come." Uh, well, you know, the new bishop of um, Norwich, Graham James, when he first arrived here, says to him, uh, "Bishop, um, tell me, are you happy, Clappy?" And the Bishop of um, Norwich, Graham James, says to him, no, I am not. I am smells and bells. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Centerville. You can, tell, uh, you, can uh, tell that. you can tell me the joy and the laughing yeah. about, about that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, I, you've shed such important light for us on, on not just on character, but on belief and uh, on strength of purpose as well. So, John, thank you so much for joining us. It's really good to talk to you. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you very much. Dr John Centerby there um, with a wonderful contribution for us um, and his tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh, the former Archbishop of York, uh, and we're grateful to him. Let's recap on the statement that was uh, issued by Buckingham Palace uh, just after midday today. Um, and it said this. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The royal family will uh, join uh, people around the world in mourning his loss. Now, um, Prince Philip will be remembered as one of the first people in the public eye to champion the cause of conservation. Dr. Sentamu was underlining that very theme for us. Uh, he took it up enthusiastically. And of course, his grandchildren, William and Harry, also showing that keen interest for nearly 20 years. He was president of the World Wildlife Fund. And uh, now the Worldwide Fund for Nature, as it's known. And after stepping down, he remained an active campaigner. Our science and environment editor, David Shukman, looks at this aspect of the Duke's life. Nature was one of Prince Philip's great loves, and the need to conserve it became a lifelong passion. He fought not just for endangered species, but for the whole of the natural world. We depend on being part of the web of life. 
We depend on every other living thing on this planet, just as much as they depend on us. From his earliest official visits around the globe, this one to Antarctica, wildlife was always a theme. He used his position to inspire younger generations. In this lecture for 2,000 children, many of the pictures were his. I don't think I'll tell you which are mine, but if you ever see a very bad one, you'll know. An emerging theme was our responsibility. If we as humans have got this power of, of life and death, not, not just life and death, but extinction and survival of, of other species of life, then we ought to exercise it with, with, um, with, with some sort of moral sense. I mean, wh why make something extinct if we don't have to? He authored or contributed to a series of dramatically titled books about threats to nature. And he took advantage of his access to governments the world over. He helped to set up the Worldwide Fund for Nature, and he led it for years. On a visit to the pandas in China, he highlighted the need to save them and their habitats. And he went live on television with David Attenborough to make that point. The panda range has been squeezed between mountains on one side and human encroachment on the other. It is important to conservation worldwide. It's been absolutely huge. You can go anywhere in the world, you know, and he will know where you have to make the connection, where you have to put the pressure, what you have to do. Uh, and he's very uh, practical in those terms. But he didn't always help himself. There was the tiger. In the 60s, he joined tiger hunts, and he once shot a tiger in India. This image was to remain controversial. It was later said that tigers weren't considered endangered back then. But Prince Philip did have his own distinct views. He supported fox hunting and the shooting of game birds, which set him at odds with many environmentalists. There is an advantage in, in people wanting to shoot because if you have a game species, you want it to survive because you want to have some more next year. It's exactly like a farmer. You want to crop it. You don't want to, you don't want to exterminate it. So this was a man with his own brand of environmental concern and he did not like being labelled. Would you describe yourself as, as a green? As green? No. No. Why not? Well, because I think that, that there's, there's a difference between being concerned for the conservation of nature and um, being a bunny hugger. When I was president of WWF, I got more letters about people, the way animals were treated in zoos, than about any concern for the, for the survival of a, of a species. But people can't get their heads around the idea of, survi of a species surviving. And as far back as 1970, with a young Prince Charles by his side, he was typically forthright about the need to be realistic in the fight for nature. After all, even naturalists drive cars occasionally. And having accepted that, we must go a step further and recognize that compromises have to be reached. Disagreement is inevitable, but the groups must go on meeting because we have simply got to hammer out answers to problems which are going to affect all life in these islands for generations to come. In many ways, Prince Philip was ahead of his time, using his fame as a royal to raise awareness of conservation, an early environmentalist who did not want to be called that, a unique campaigner for a cause that's ever more relevant. So just another important aspect of the uh, Duke's life and the contribution that he made. We were talking just a short while ago to the Archbishop, former Archbishop of York, Dr John Sentamu, who of course made it quite clear that uh, he enjoyed the Duke's company, he liked his humour, he liked his uh, character, uh, that they had quite a few sparring matches in terms of discussing faith and other ideas. Um, with me is my colleague Andrew Marr, uh, who also knew the Duke. Uh, Andrew, of course, presented the History of Modern Britain uh, and uh, the Diamond Queen series about uh, the rain. Andrew, thanks for, for joining us. Um, so you met him clearly on several occasions. What was the impression times. he made? Well, I think if I said that I was a close personal friend, a dry, sardonic smile would have spread yeah. over his face. Yeah. Uh, we met a, a few times at drinks parties and so forth. And you and I, we live in an age of euphemism where everybody in public life goes around desperately trying not to offend anybody else at all costs. 
he wasn't quite like that, mm. I think it's fair to say. Like most people meeting him to the, for the first time, I was slightly nervous. And I can remember we were talking about Charles Darwin. And he said, so, so, how does Charles Darwin stand in history? And I said, I thought he was probably the most important Victorian of all. Mm. And there was a short pause. And he looked at me very beadily and he said... I intensely dislike generalizations, and I felt absolutely crushed. And the point was, he intensely dis disliked euphemism and smoothing things over. He went around talking very, very frankly, and actually that, I find that very refreshing, and I think many people did. Many other people were deeply offended by it. He's a very controversial figure, even now. Yeah. L let's talk about the elements of controversy, yeah. but within the context of the contribution that he made. Yes, yeah, so you could call him... Uh, emblematic of some of the most difficult aspects of the British monarchy, the real belief in hierarchy and precedence, the highly sort of military tone of the British monarchy all throughout his time, and, of course, those famous, those notorious gaffes he made directed at Chinese people and Indians and many others around the world. And you could see him as a kind of caricature. He said, I have become a caricature. There's nothing I can do about it. But a lot of people saw him like that. But he was also, you could argue, he was a, an asylum refugee seeker, uh, escaped from, from um, Greece just after its catastrophic war with Turkey. His father could have been lined up against a wall and shot after the end of that war, but King George V rescued the family, and they were rescued by a British destroyer. He was sent in an orange box, in an orange crate he arrived in France, and then his parents split up. He had a very, very uh, rackety and difficult early life. Um, his father went off to have a high old time on the south of France. His mother succumbed to a sort of form of religious mania and was treated by Freudians in a Swiss clinic. All his sisters married Germans just before the war. Two of them were married to members of the SS. Um, so he was completely divided from the rest of his family. He was cast adrift in Britain and eventually, as it were, picked up by Lord Louis Mountbatten, one of the more charismatics and difficult figures in the royal family history, and really found Gordonston this remarkable experimental school in Scotland, founded by a German-Jewish refugee yeah. called Kurt Hahn, the thing that made him, yeah. and then the British Navy. Mm. So he comes from this very, very... He was a, a real outsider and an outsider all his life. The kind of stuffier members of the court of George VI couldn't stand him mm. and really were really quite worried and offended when the Queen married him, so this will never, ever work. She was entranced by him. Yeah. They met for the first time when she was 13, mm. and he was 18 at Dartmouth. You've seen the pictures yeah. already on the news. And she was apparently completely transfixed mm. by him. Mm. And all the way through the war, when she was a young girl growing up in Windsor in wartime conditions, she had a photograph of a heavily bearded Philip on the mantelpiece. And she's, just ne she's been entranced by him ever since. So for her, above all, this is a really, really dark day. Yes, and, uh, and it's important to emphasise that. Yes. Um, when you talk about the concept of the outsider, mm. for someone who, for lots of people today, actually embodies much of the establishment. He is um, the establishment, yes. yes. So there is that inbuilt paradox. What did that sense of being an outsider lead to in terms of his desire to modernise the royal family, to engage in uh, projects which some people thought were, frankly, batty at yes. the time, the yes. environment, for example? Um, what did he achieve? Well, the World Wildlife Fund, or the World Fund, World Fund for Nature, was one of his ideas. He was very, very involved in it. He was one of the founders of it. He was an early conservationist, very close to the, the painter and broadcaster uh, Peter Scott, who was a very early conservationist, and later, of course, to uh, the Attenborough mm. project, as it were, you can mm. call it that. Um, so he thought things through from first principles again and again and again. He had a very, very close interest in science and technology. And therefore, things like global warming, things like species extinction, which we all talk about these days, he was on that very, very early. We saw that in the film just now. Um, but also he sort of decarbonised, uh, as it were, the palaces early on. He was into green fuel and alternatives to petrol when everyone thought that was a completely mad yeah. idea. Way, way ahead of his time. Um, he believed, it's strange to think of it now, he believed in the royal family opening up and becoming more media-friendly. He was behind that early colour film, The Royal Family, in the 1960s. He was a great supporter of that. Uh, he never, ever liked the British press, particularly the tabloid press. Couldn't stand them. They couldn't stand him. The loathing was mutual. And I think he found, as a kind of quite a proud and prickly man... And, you know, we're all familiar with the concept of people who have got an outside skin, a sort of integument or a hide, to hide great personal sensitivity. He was a very spiritual, very interested in poetry, mm. quite a sensitive man, I think, behind all that prickliness. Mm. Um, he found the endless observation and voyeurism of life in the public eye yeah. 
in this very, very competitive media world we all live in, almost intolerable. I think that was the hardest thing probably throughout his life. But as I say, he was a sensitive man and he was very acutely aware of his children's marital difficulties and his grandchildren. Yeah. And privately behind the scenes, I'm told, he spent a lot of time working with, for instance, Diana during her darkest and bleakest moments, trying to win her round, trying to uh, jolly her up. He might not have always had the most tactful, most modern way of putting things, but he was a sensitive man. That was the point I was going to raise, Andrew, which was to do with the last few decades where there have been very public differences mm -hmm. and very public problems for the family. Um, what would have been the extent of his influence behind the scenes um, in terms of trying to find solutions to those? You suggest it was big. Well, I mean, of course, the royal family is, as it were, a matriarchy. It's head, headed by a woman, but internally it was a patriarchy. He was the big daddy in the family, as it were. He was the person people went to with their problems and was slightly nervous about his reaction, no doubt, from time to time. But he talked to all of them a lot. Um, he reflected on his own upbringing, which, as I say, was very difficult. Yeah. And he knew what it was like to try and join this very, very difficult, very hierarchical, very traditional and quite sort of rebarbative organisation, the royal family. He knew how hard it was. And therefore, I think he had a sensitivity for others, perhaps including Meghan, I don't know, mm. trying to do the same thing in later generations. Mm. When people, as they will now for days to come, uh, until the funeral happens, whenever that is, um, as people try to sum up mm. his life and try to sum up his importance to the Queen, try to sum up his importance to public life in the UK, um, it's one thing to do it in the next few days. Uh, what will people be making of Prince Philip, let's say in five or ten years' time? What will be the lasting legacy if there is one? Well, that's a really hard yeah. question to end on. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what is absolutely clear is, that, as Nick Witchell was saying, it is impossible to imagine this Queen's reign without him. She was constantly turning to people and saying, what does Philip think? What does Philip think about this or that? Yeah. He was right beside her all the way through. Uh, and therefore, it was, in many senses, and I don't mean this to sound offensive, it was almost like a joint reign. Mm. He was absolutely crucial. It has been one of the longest reigns, the longest reign in British history, and she has taken us from one kind of country, almost all white, very, very class divided, loving our empire and all the rest of it, to a completely different country that we are today. However long we stay together as a country, who knows? Mm. She's taken us on that journey, and he has been there on every step of the way. I think more, in fact, as a moderniser and a reformer than his public reputation today suggests. Andrew, good to talk to you as ever. Thank you so much. You, thank you. Andrew Marr there with uh, his uh, eloquent uh, analysis of the Duke's contribution and character uh, based on his own knowledge and, of course, his reading of how things have developed over the years. We're grateful to him. Now, the Duke of Edinburgh's sporting activities are yet another aspect of his life that we haven't uh, discussed properly, provided him with uh, a welcome opportunity to get away from the more formal aspects of royal duty. And for him, sport became an outlet for restless energy, uh, and he proved himself to be a keen and talented competitor in a number of different sports. Now, our correspondent, Natalie Perks, uh, looks back at the Duke's uh, life in sport. Prince Philip always enjoyed sport, and he often excelled at it. At school, he learned to love sailing. As a wedding present, he and the Queen were given a yacht. The Duke took part in the Royal Regatta at Cowes for 50 years, even winning the most prestigious trophy, the Britannia Cup, with his friend Uffa Fox in 1952. The thing about going to sea is you're suddenly exposed to, to an element which, is, which you can't really control. You're subject to it. And I think that's quite good for the soul, frankly. And now a change of bowling from the pavilion end. As an enthusiastic cricketer, he also drew it's praise from high places. And that one moved across the leg. He has a perfect action for a right hand off spin bowler. <laughs> But what you might not know is just how the playing fields around us are a huge part of his legacy. While councils were busy selling them off, his tireless fundraising campaign led to thousands of UK sites being saved. It's a true testament to his passion and commitment to sport and the opportunities that he saw that sport could create um, for so many young people who didn't necessarily have access to, to green space. The Duke shared the Queen's love of horses and became one of the top four polo players in Britain in the mid-60s, cementing the sport as a firm royal favourite. 
Arthritis ended his playing career at 50. Go on, you stupid hole. Get on. But carriage driving became his new passion and he was instrumental in drawing up the rules. He helped raise its profile and competed for Britain at World and European Championships. Great Britain was represented by George Bowman. Fellow teammate George Bowman remembered him fondly. I was a scrap merchant. And of course, uh, he was a prince. And they made, at times, people made a lot about this. But he never treated me any different. He always looked at me like an equal. And uh, <clears throat> that was one of the things I really admired about him. Despite some hair raising spills along the way, the Duke carried on well into old age. His passion made sport a family affair. Not just keen on sport, but a very, very talented and, of course, competitive sportsman as well. Um, the Duke of Edinburgh's life uh, in sport, and just a sense of what he uh, was really engaged in over several decades and how those interests really changed uh, as he got older. Um, Let's just think about, again, the contribution that he made. Not, not so much interests uh, such as sport, but the way that the Duke developed interests um, and then tried to change direction of policy, tried to change people's habits when it came to the environment, tried to change people's attitudes to things. Um, and to think about where he stands, really, in the, uh, in the gallery, if you like, of British public life uh, over the last uh, 60 years or so. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that the uh, historian and author, Professor Kate Williams, uh, joins us now. Uh, Kate, thanks so much for, for sharing your time with us today. Um, first of all, um, let's just have your sense of what the Duke's death signifies in terms of, you know, the gap that he leaves. He does leave a gap. This really is the end of an era. The Duke was born in 1921. He saw so many changes in the 20th century, the 21st century. He has been the longest serving consort, the Queen, the longest reigning monarch, of course. And he's been the longest serving consort since 1952, not too many years after their marriage. Both the Duke and the Queen, they expected to have, I, I think, you know, a good 10, 15 years as a young married couple together and the Queen perhaps to come to the throne at 40. But the King, King George VI, died so very young comparatively, and they were catapulted into this new life. And it's one to which the Duke, with his glittering naval career, he fought so bravely on the Allied side, suffered a lot of anti-German prejudice after the war, despite all of his service. He really threw himself into his role as consort, even though there were times when he was mistrusted and, and sort of ignored and overlooked, and did so much for British science, British engineering, British design, and 22,000 engagements, 5,000 speeches, over 750 charities. And really, I think because he came from this, his life, he'd suffered so much as a child. His family had to flee Greece when he was 18 months old. He lived in exile. He never felt he had a fixed home. He always saw, I think, that the royal family ruled and said he, that they ruled by the consent of the people. If the people didn't want them anymore, they would no longer be there. So he had a lot of attention to how the royal family appeared. He thought very carefully about the Queen on her royal mint, on the Mary Gillick, who made the sculpture of the Queen to go on the royal mint coins when the Queen came to the throne, and also was particularly instrumental in the coronation being televised, the idea that TV cameras should come in and show the monarchy as they were and invite the people in. So he leaves a great gap. He was a great force of energy, of devotion to the monarchy, and above all, in a time when men really did not walk behind their wives. He put so much into the role of consort, so devoted to the monarchy, to the queen, to the country. And I think for so many, they thought he would always be around. And it's so sad that he's, he's passed just a few months before his 100th birthday. Uh, Kate, when we look back at his life and we think about, obviously, the family life, and he was such a dominant force within the royal family, then we think of the causes that he supported. You mentioned, you know, hundreds of them in some cases where the charities were concerned. Um, what will stand out for people in years to come? Will it be the fact that he backed some causes which in their time were not fashionable, that he was forward-looking, that in terms of the environment, in terms of conservation, he was way ahead of his time on those? Will they be the ones that stand out? Yes, I think the environment, conservation, the WWF, the idea of conserving species. I was just learning yesterday that one in four mammals in, in Britain at the National Trust are endangered. 
these were things that Prince Philip was talking about long before anyone really understood or, or paid much recognition in wider public life to conservation. His advocation of conservation and of design, of engineering, the Prince Philip Design Prize. So post-war Britain was uh, suffering a terrible recession. Let's remember that the, that the marriage of Elizabeth and Philip was not made a day off because it was thought a day off would affect the economy too badly. And when the Queen became the Queen, there was still the suffering of recession and really, Philip, I think, saw the importance of design, of engineering, was very vital in the setting up of the Royal College of Engineering, of the Prince Philip Design Prize, and even his own personal design. He was uh, very instrumental in designing a, a, Windsor, a window in Windsor Castle after it burnt down in 1992. He really, I think, espoused these causes that no one really recognised at the time. And I think the commercial value of engineering and design, conservation, and also young people, the Duke of Edinburgh Award, which uh, set up in 1956, it's done by so many young people uh, and given the idea of empowerment, the idea of giving them new hobbies. I did it myself. I don't know whether you, I'm sure you did as well, Hugh. And you know, always thinking, trying to be a step ahead of what you could do with the role of consort. And I think really develop the role of consort to be not just uh, always backing up the Queen, but developing a huge amount of his own ideas, engagements, and indeed endeavours as well. And he's raised the bar very high in terms of those you have to follow. Kate, you don't want to talk about my performance in the Duke of Edinburgh scheme. We'll gloss over that very quickly. Um, it's good to talk to you as ever, Kate. Thank you so much for joining us. Professor Kate uh, Williams there, um, uh, joining us there, the historian and the author, uh, with her thoughts on the, uh, the legacy of the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, let's go back to Windsor at this point and talk to our correspondent, uh, Helena Wilkinson. People have been laying flowers, I think, uh, Helena, haven't they? What's been going on? Yes, they have, Hugh. Uh, the Royal Standard is uh, flying here at Windsor Castle, which means, of course, that the Queen is here in residence. But this really has become a focal point here at Windsor Castle. Uh, this, as we now know, is where the Duke of Edinburgh uh, died peacefully this morning. But uh, if we uh, try and show you some of the flowers that have been left uh, outside the castle uh, over the last three hours or so. Um, some simple messages on some of the cards. One of them uh, simply reads, rest in peace, Prince Philip. Another one is addressed to Her Majesty the Queen, uh, sending deepest condolences. Now, a bit earlier on, Hugh, there were, I would say, dozens of people who had gathered outside the castle. Um, not surprisingly, a sombre, reflective mood uh, for those people who have come to uh, reflect on what was a remarkable life and a remarkably long life as well. The Duke of Edinburgh, of course, uh, just two months off his 100th birthday. Um, you can see down uh, past the castle, there are still some crowds uh, here, but they tend to come and then move on fairly quickly. And of course, don't forget, uh, we still have the COVID restrictions. There are a number of officers dotted around, but they don't seem to have had to do a great deal, given that people are coming, perhaps leaving flowers, spending a little bit of time here uh, and then moving on. As you know, Hugh, the Duke of Edinburgh spent uh, a month in hospital in London. He was treated for an infection and also a pre-existing heart condition. Uh, he arrived back here at Windsor Castle around uh, three weeks ago or so uh, and was reunited with the Queen, of course, here at the castle. And they had spent the last year since the pandemic began to unravel. Uh, both the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh uh, spent time here together in a small bubble with household staff uh, here at the castle. The Duke uh, celebrated quietly his 99th birthday here last year and they also celebrated uh, their wedding anniversary. And you may remember uh, the pictures of the Duke of Edinburgh re released by the palace last year on his 99th birthday, uh, the Queen and the Duke looking uh, happy in the sunshine here at the castle. Uh, but thoughts here for those people who have gathered here at the castle, Hugh, very much with Her Majesty the Queen, and I think the Queen will uh, no doubt take comfort from the outpouring of grief. Uh, I think it's fair to say here, uh, with the dozens of flowers that have been left here, uh, to remember the Duke of Edinburgh, who has died at the age of 99. Helena, thank you so much again. Helena Wilkinson there with the latest uh, at a very sunny Windsor the castle there. And the Royal Standard just out of uh, view on the right-hand side, showing that the Queen uh, is in residence today. And that is where the Duke passed away this morning at the age of 99.
Now, if you're just joining us, uh, wherever you are around the world, uh, here in the UK, uh, or indeed uh, overseas in all corners of the world on our BBC World Service, um, I'm uh, welcoming all of you to this uh, special programme, uh, which is being uh, uh, offered by BBC News following the announcement of the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, Prince Philip's uh, death was announced at, uh, at about midday London time uh, in a statement from Buckingham Palace. And this is what the statement said. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, uh, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. And further announcements will be made in due course. The Royal Family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. Our coverage will continue and my colleague Rita Chakrabarti will be joining you in just a few minutes' time. Before that, uh, it seems a good moment for us to pause and to just reflect on a very long and a very rich life um, that was lived by the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, he was within weeks of his 100th birthday. Uh, he died at the age of 99. And uh, to understand a little more about that life, what he made of it, how he took advantage of his opportunities, how he backed certain causes, and how he made a huge contribution to public life in the UK. Uh, here's my colleague, Nicholas Witchell. First after them, her husband, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, who, with his hands between the hands of the Queen, becomes her liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. At the Queen's coronation, he was the first person after the bishops to pay homage to her. Philip knelt before his wife and pledged his loyalty. Faith and truth I will bear unto you, live and, and so, against all manner of rising, sense. touches the crown upon her head and kisses her upon the left cheek. As a male consort to a female sovereign, Philip had no constitutional significance. Yet no one was closer to the monarchy or of greater importance to the monarch than he was. By instinct, he was a leader, yet Philip had always to take second place. By nature, he spoke his mind, and that sometimes got him into trouble. Yet, for decade after decade, his was the support that mattered most to the throne. Philip was born in Corfu in 1921. His family was part of European royalty. He was a prince of Greece, but his ancestors were largely Danish, German and Russian. Philip had a rootless childhood. His family was banished from Greece, his parents separated, and he was sent to Gordonston School in northern Scotland. The Spartan atmosphere there suited him. As the Second World War loomed, Philip was an 18-year-old Royal Navy cadet at Dartmouth. His Majesty walking down the ranks of the cadets. And when the King and Queen visited the college, they brought with them their 13-year-old daughter, Princess Elizabeth. According to witnesses, Philip showed off a great deal, but the meeting had made a deep impression on the princess. Philip served in the Royal Navy with distinction during the war. When the fighting ended, he started to escort Elizabeth to family gatherings. He changed his name to Philip Mountbatten and became a British citizen. The public realised there was a romance. Yet within Buckingham Palace, Philip was regarded with suspicion. One courtier wrote privately that he was rough, uneducated and would probably not be faithful. But Elizabeth was deeply in love and in the summer of 1947, the palace announced their engagement. It is with the greatest pleasure that the King and Queen announced the betrothal of their dearly beloved daughter, the Princess Elizabeth, to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, RN. On the 20th of November, 1947, the newly created Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, stood within Westminster Abbey and exchanged marriage vows with the heir to the British throne. I, Philip, I, Philip, take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. Take thee, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. for Elizabeth and Philip. Again and again, they joyfully responded. In 1952, the couple set off on a tour of the Commonwealth. The King came with them to the airport. It was the last time they were to see King George VI, who, unknown to his daughter, was in the final stages of lung cancer. It was a farewell. It was also, as events turned out, goodbye. It was at a hunting lodge in Kenya that Philip told his wife of her father's death. Someone who was there said Philip looked as though half the world had dropped on him. 
they returned to London to lead the national mourning. And now here is the Queen. His wife was now Queen. Philip was there in support, but he was never given the title Prince Consort and his role was undefined. He channeled some of his restless energy into a boisterous social life. He and a group of male friends met every week in rooms above a restaurant in London, Soho. There were long convivial lunches, visits to nightclubs and glamorous companions. By the 1960s, Philip's life was more settled. He and the Queen had completed their family with two more children, Andrew and Edward, who joined Charles and Anne, and he had found a new role for himself. Is it the 18th we're due back now? 18. From his office in the palace, he promoted issues in which he had a personal interest. 40 minutes to get round the world. Well, it's going to be a bit of a rush. It may leave you a little bit muddled. Yet diplomacy but, uh, seemed alien to him. He urged British industry to pull its finger out and complained on American television that the royal family didn't have enough money. Inevitably, if, if, if nothing happens, we shall either have to, uh, I don't know, we may have to move into smaller premises, who knows? <laughs> he blundered on a state visit to China with the Queen. He made what he thought was a private remark about slitty eyes. It was a diplomatic gaffe which dominated the headlines and added to his reputation for making misjudged remarks. It's all right, Smith. Yet Philip had a sharp, inquiring mind and was determined to make a contribution of his own. The groundbreaking 60s film Royal Family was made largely at his instigation because he felt it was time for the family to show a more human face to the world. The salad is ready. Good. And for many years he toured the globe as president of the then World Wildlife Fund, speaking out about the need to conserve nature. We depend on being part of the web of life. We depend on every other living thing on this planet just as much as they depend on us. He promoted technology, helped underprivileged children and had a lifelong interest in spiritual issues. But his most lasting creation was the scheme named after him, the Duke of Edinburgh's award, which encouraged young people to realise their potential. To give young people a chance to discover their own abilities for themselves as an introduction to the responsibilities and interests of the grown-up world and incidentally, to make new friends and have a great deal of fun and satisfaction in the present. <laughs> no decade was more difficult for the royal family than the 1990s. The death of Diana, Princess of Wales, was both a family tragedy and a moment of tension for the monarchy. It was the Queen to whom the country looked for public comfort. It was Philip to whom the Queen turned for private support. And still Prince William with his head hung, walking next to his grandfather. It was Philip whose gentle encouragement had persuaded William and Harry to walk behind their mother's coffin to her funeral. And contrary to his sometimes insensitive image, it had been Philip who'd taken the lead in trying to understand the domestic problems of his children, prompted perhaps by his own memories of what it's like to marry into the royal family. Philip remained physically active at an age when most men would have relished retirement. He went carriage driving and he was still carrying out more engagements than many younger members of the family. Some he did alone, such as this visit to British troops in Iraq. How did you get into this? <laughs> but most he did with his wife. He was the figure a few paces behind the Queen, always looking out for her and often guiding children through the barriers to present their flowers to her. By the time of his 90th birthday in June 2011, celebrated at his insistence with little fanfare, he'd accepted that it was time to slow down a little. I reckon I've done my bit. I, I want to enjoy myself for a bit now. Um, with less responsibility, less uh, frantic rushing about, less preparation, less trying to think of something to say. Um, and on top of that, memories going, I can't remember names and things. Yes, I, I'm just sort of winding down. There was little immediate evidence, though, of any winding down. Despite a serious health scare at Christmas 2011, when he had to be taken to hospital with a blocked coronary artery, he remained at the Queen's side for most of her Diamond Jubilee programme, which took them the length and breadth of the country. It wasn't until 2017 that the Duke, then aged 96, carried out his final solo engagement. 
It was a parade for the Royal Marines on the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. It was pouring with rain, but, as ever, duty took priority. He took his time meeting those on parade and taking the salute as the Marines marched past to bid him farewell. His life after that was much quieter, spent mostly at the Queen's estate at Sandringham. It was there in January 2019, while he was driving himself from the estate, that he survived a serious road accident. His vehicle overturned, he was badly shaken, and he surrendered his driving licence shortly afterwards. By now he was rarely seen in public, there were occasional appearances at family occasions such as weddings, yet he remained a supportive figure to the Queen and his family. Throughout his adult life, despite the formality of his position, Philip retained his own style of doing things. He made his own uncompromising mark on national life. He once summed up his approach in characteristically forthright fashion. I've just done what I think is my best. I can't suddenly change my whole way of doing things. I can't change my interests. I can't change my way in which uh, I react to things. It's, it's, it's part of that's somebody's style, and, and it's too bad. It's very lumpy. Throughout all the monarchy's many ups and downs since the Second World War, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, the longest-serving consort in British history, was the restless outsider who put his wife and duty first. In doing so, he fulfilled his coronation oath of allegiance to Elizabeth, his queen. Their marriage and his support were the essential foundations which underpinned the success of her reign. In a speech to celebrate their golden wedding anniversary, the Queen spoke of the debt that she and the country owed him. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. You are watching a special programme here on BBC News. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, at the age of 99. Prince Philip was by far the longest serving consort in British history, a role that he shaped from the start. Try and grow into it, and, and that was by trial and error. And, um, I, there, was, there was no precedent. But if I asked somebody what you expect me to do, they all looked blank. They had no idea. Nobody had much idea. He was 26 when he married the then Princess Elizabeth in 1947. Within five years, she would be queen. She has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. Tributes to the Duke and messages of condolence to the Queen have been sent from leaders around the world, including here in the UK. We mourn today with Her Majesty the Queen. We offer our condolences to her and to all her family. And we give thanks as a nation and a kingdom for the extraordinary life and work 
of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. In recent years, there had been signs the Duke of Edinburgh's health was declining. He'd been admitted to hospital a number of times throughout the last decade. He returned home to Windsor on the 16th of March after a month-long stay in hospital. His loss will be felt most keenly by the Queen, his family and beyond. People have been laying flowers outside the gates of Windsor Castle, where the Duke passed away peacefully this morning. And the flag is flying at half-mast at Buckingham Palace. We'll be looking back and reflecting on the Duke's extraordinary life of service and of duty. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. In a statement, the palace said, It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The royal family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. Well, I'm joined now by our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. Um, Nick, uh, as I said, tributes have been flooding in and we've heard in the last few hours people remembering the Duke of Ed Edinburgh with fondness and with affection. But it's probably worth taking a step back and reflecting at this moment on his legacy. You know, he once described himself in a moment of modesty as a discredited Balkan prince of no particular merit. And yet, for 73 years as husband, for nearly 70 years as consort to his wife, the Queen, he was there in support. His was the support that mattered most. It was, I think it is fair to say, an incalculably important contribution to the success and stability of the reign. We owe him a debt greater than we will ever know. The words of the Queen herself talking about her husband at the time of their golden wedding. My strength and stay, we're all familiar with that phrase. But at the time of the D Diamond Jubilee, she described him as my constant strength and guide. This from a monarch who by then had been on the throne for 60 years. She was referring to her husband as her guide. And that, I think, gives us a real insight into the importance of the relationship that existed between them. We will look back eventually, I'm sure, when this reign does finally come to an end, on the reign of Queen Elizabeth II as being one of the most remarkable reigns in the long history of the British monarchy. And at this moment, with the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh, I think it is right to say that he did make a vital and huge and unrecognised and unappreciated contribution to the success and the stability, as I say, of that reign. And it's a moment of real national sadness in this country and particularly, of course, for the Queen herself. There are tributes being paid from around the Commonwealth and elsewhere, from Australia, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. He embodied a generation that we will never see again. From Canada, their Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, a man of great purpose and conviction. From the United States, from the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, his was a life distinguished by an inspiring ethic of dedicated service. There will be many, many tributes in this country and around the world and we note that Parliament is to be recalled on Monday so that MPs and peers can pay their tributes. It is, as you say, almost impossible to imagine the Queen's reign without him. And yet, by being her consort, he in fact had no formal constitutional position. None at all. Um, it's said that shortly after she took the throne, he ordered books about the role played by the Prince Consort Albert, who was did have a constitutional role alongside Britain's previous Queen, Queen Victoria. He was never given that role, any constitutional role at all. Um, and we know that this Queen, Queen Elizabeth, is a monarch of great constitutional propriety. She would never have entertained sharing state papers and matters of state with her husband. And there is no doubt that he found that difficult. I mean, he appreciated that that is how it had to be. They both, remember, they're both of royal background. They're third cousins. They're both great-great-grandchildren of Queen Victoria. So he knew the score. But nonetheless, because of his personality, because of his dominant 
personality. He would have gone far in the Royal Navy if he'd been able to stay in the Royal Navy. He found it, certainly in the 1950s, extremely difficult to find a role for himself. And the courtiers at the time were very suspicious of him. Rough and uneducated, said the previous George VI private secretary. They were suspicious of this man coming in. He hadn't come from their quarters, as it were. He didn't go to Eton. He wasn't from the Guards Regiment. He was Gordonston and the Royal Navy. He was an outsider. He was restless. He was iconoclastic. And that's why the courtiers, Buckingham Palace in the 1950s, was wary of him. But he found a role for himself. Eventually, it took a while, and he found the 1950s very frustrating. But he did then realise that he needed to carve out uh, particular areas that would be his, the environment, the Duke of Edinburgh's award, now in 130 countries, something like that, 7 million people have taken part in that, and other spiritual matters. This was a man with a very keen intellectual curiosity, and he deployed that to effect um, setting up the Windsor Conferences, they're called, on spiritual matters, on technology, and on a host of other things. Now, occasionally he put his foot in it, famously, you know, he was the, known for his gaffes, but... When you put all of that aside and look at the personality and the contribution in the round, I think you have to say that this was a man of distinction, a man of many facets, a man of a sharp mind, occasionally a sharp tongue, who did make a real contribution of his own. It's so interesting that you call him iconoclastic because younger viewers particularly will think of him as an old man. Um, but he was, in his time, a real moderniser. He, he absolutely was, yes. And uh, in, in, of course, contrast to his wife, um, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, is traditional. She, certainly back in the early years of her reign, she found it quite difficult, the public-facing aspect of being monarch and head of state. She's naturally shy and reserved, in complete contrast to Philip. Perhaps that was one of the reasons why she was so attracted to him. She recognised that he was uh, aspects of his personality that she didn't possess, but which she wanted to sort of help shape her, help, help her and support her in her role as monarch. So, yes, he was a, a moderniser in the 1950s when Buckingham Palace was staffed by very different people with very different attitudes to those now, and he wanted to shake it up. And the courtiers then were, were as I was saying a moment ago, were, were reluctant, but he found a way. He, he did uh, uh, work his way into the system. And it's important also to remember how dutiful he was, even in his 90s. He was attending hundreds of events every year. Yeah, I mean, like the Queen, you know, they, they recognised that in each other. And I think because they were from both from royal backgrounds, both from that generation, the wartime generation, which um, realised and saw duty as being the, the prerequisite of people in their position, in the privileged position in which they occupy in the United Kingdom and indeed in other countries, um, th that, that was expected of them. And they never questioned it. Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh would have found it strange if he hadn't been fulfilling public duties even up to the age of, what was it, 96 or whatever it was, you know, when he retired in 2017. And I think he enjoyed it. I think I, w I saw him once at the um, presentation of gold awards to uh, people who'd, who'd gone through the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. And he must then have been about 93 or 94. And he was energised by meeting all these young people. You know, he needn't have done that. He needn't have spent the time that he did going from room to room at St James's Palace, meeting all these young people who'd got the gold award. And you know, he just sort of fed off that. And that, I think, uh, personified his approach to public life that this was expected of him and he was going to go on and do it until he felt that he really could not do it any longer. Theirs was a partnership of over seven decades, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, and they were very rarely apart. What is this going to mean now for the Queen? Well, I mean, they were apart quite a bit. I mean, although it was a very strong relationship, and there's no doubt at all, you know, people who know them say she was absolutely devoted to him. You know, she fell heavily in love with him. There was never anyone else, no other serious uh, uh, pursuer of her heart or uh, in those early days when she was Princess Elizabeth. Um, but they were, you know, because they both took duty so seriously and recognised the nature of the job that they were doing, that they recognised that uh, sometimes duty kept them apart. And after his retirement in 2017, the Duke of Edinburgh, before the pandemic started, was spending most of his time up at Sandringham on uh, the estate up in Norfolk. And they were perfectly happy to be apart. Again, I think it's a generational thing. People nowadays may find that really quite curious. But 
With the pandemic, they both then were in isolation at Windsor Castle, and it is said that the Queen massively enjoyed, really enjoyed, the fact that they were brought and forced back together again and that they were able to spend time together again over this past year because the Queen will have known, obviously, that uh, time was, was limited. Um, he was approaching his 99th and then he's approaching now his 100th birthday, just two months short of his 100th birthday. So it cannot be a surprise that uh, uh, the Duke has passed at this age. But nonetheless, after 73 years of marriage, it will still be a very considerable emotional shock to her to feel that finally the end has come. Nick, for the time being, many thanks. Our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell there with his reflections on the Duke of Edinburgh. Well, we can speak now to our Royal Correspondent Sarah Campbell, who's outside Buckingham Palace for us. And Sarah, inevitably, uh, Buckingham Palace, a focal point for people wanting to express their sadness. Yes, Rita, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm surrounded on both sides by members of the media from countless countries uh, around the world, different accents along here, maybe 30 or 40 news crews reflecting the fact that this is the death uh, of a British figure, but one who was also a global figure. And as you say, Buckingham Palace is the place probably to people around the world which is most associated with the royal family and most associated perhaps with Prince Philip. How many times did we watch him on the balcony there? He went to thousands of garden parties, you know, engagements. His last engagement back in August 2017 was in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace where he, he signed off as the Captain General of the Royal Marines. So understandable, I think, I think that people will want to come here and lay tributes. And they have been doing that steadily uh, over the last three hours uh, since the news broke. There was, it's traditional for a, an announcement to be placed on the gates of Buckingham Palace for big royal news. Um, that was done, but uh, rather than being left there for 24 hours to allow people to, to come and read it and see it in person, it was taken down, actually, in uh, less than an hour. And that's reflective of the fact that there is a pandemic ongoing and there is a concern, I think, that although the palace the royal family would like people to mourn and to remember Prince Philip. Uh, they want to do it, people to do it safely. Uh, and so uh, any, anything which might draw crowds uh, is, is going to be uh, stepped away from, I think, uh, over the next few days. So that's why the announcement is no longer there. Um, I was down having a chat to some of the people, you know, asking why they've come along. It's the Easter holidays. There's quite a few people in London at the moment anyway. But there was certainly a sense that people just wanted to come and and either see what's going on or to lay some flowers. Um, a couple of signs. One said, to a true gentleman, thank you for your devoted service to our country. Another one said, what a life. Thank you for your service to our country. So really the sort of overwhelming messages about thank you and a recognition that uh, as the longest serving consort in British history, um, Prince Philip's sense of duty um, lasted for decades and I think a thank you from the people for that. Um, in terms of chatting to people, obviously there's, there's young people here for whom maybe Prince Philip isn't such a figure in their lives. He of course, as you say, retired in 2017 and, and really since then he's spent time uh, away from the public eye as much as possible. We've seen him maybe at a few sort of family weddings, births, uh, you know, the, the, the odd photograph, but really he hasn't been a presence um, as he has been for so many of those decades before his retirement. I asked one 15-year-old who was down there what Prince Philip meant to her, and she said that she'd come down because it was mainly for her nan, who'd phoned her in tears, so upset at the death of Prince Philip. A young boy said, well, he was just really well known, and his mum said that he'll be missed. But I think everybody said, actually, today that they'll be thinking of the Queen, thinking of the fact that the Queen has lost her husband of 73 years. So there's the sense of loss of a public figure, but also a recognition that he was uh, a husband, he was a father, a grandfather, a great grandfather. And so there is a family in mourning today. Sarah, of the sadness felt by different generations of people. Um, while you were speaking, we were seeing pictures of the scene at Buckingham Palace, and it does look as if people have heeded the COVID-19 warnings and not come in large numbers. <clears throat> 
I think you're right. People are being moved on. You maybe can't see that from your pictures, but people are being discouraged from standing around and sort of, you know, if you have some flowers, lay them flower, lay them quickly um, and then move on. So um, that is the case. But, uh, you know, it's it's we have to remember that this is a pandemic. Um, the pandemic is ongoing. And um, I was sort of saying earlier that actually that must be a sadness which will be shared by so many families actually across Britain and across the world that over the last few months, which would turn out to be Prince Philip's final few months, his family, um, his large family, has been deprived of direct contact with him. He has, of course, been shielding in Windsor Castle alongside the Queen, which, as you heard Nick there say, was... Ironically, they probably managed to spend more time with each other over the last year than they perhaps otherwise would have done because, of course, he's retired. She's very much not retired from public duties, so her duties would have kept her away from her husband. But on the flip side of the coin um, is that his children, his grandchildren, great-grandchildren, yes, they could Zoom or FaceTime or you know contact via social media, but as Prince Charles said late last year, it's just not the same. It's not the same as giving someone a hug. So I'm sure that sense of it would have been nice to have spent more time physically with him over the last few months will be a sadness for the royal family and I think will be a sadness that will be reflected in many families uh, across the UK. Sarah, for the time being, many thanks. That's uh, Sarah Campbell there. Well, let's go now to Windsor and speak to our correspondent, Helena Wilkinson, who is there for us. And Helena, um, details have been released, I think, of the funeral arrangements for the Duke. Uh, yes, that's right, Rita. Uh, in the last couple of minutes or so, we've had um, uh, some limited details about the funeral arrangements for the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, which have come from the College of Arms. Um, what they have said is that the funeral will not be a state funeral. Uh, His Royal Highness's body will lie in rest, at rest in Windsor Castle, here at Windsor Castle, uh, ahead of the funeral, and uh, the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral will take place in St George's Chapel, which is just behind us uh, in the castle grounds there. Uh, it is, uh, the statement goes on to say, this is in line with custom and with His Royal Highness's wishes. Um, of course, as Sarah touched on and you touched on, we are uh, still living under various COVID restrictions at the moment and social distancing, of course. Uh, and the statement goes on to say the arrangements, and this is no surprise really, uh, the funeral arrangements have been revised in view of the circumstances arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. And it also go goes on to say, regretfully, uh, they are requesting that members of the public do not attempt to attend or participate in any of the events that make up the funeral. So a few details about uh, the funeral itself. Uh, the Duke of Edin Edinburgh's body will lie at rest here at Windsor Castle ahead of the funeral in St George's Chapel just behind us, Rita. Helena, you've been uh, at Windsor for a little while now. Just describe to us the scene and the atmosphere. Well, the Royal Standard uh, is flying uh, at full mast. That hasn't been lowered. And the reason is that is that is the one flag that is not lowered on occasions uh, like this. But as the news ripples through this town uh, at midday today, uh, uh, the people here, mainly local people, began to gather here uh, outside the castle. There is, not surprisingly, a sombre, uh, reflective mood here. And we might be able to just show you some of the flowers uh, that have been laid um, over the past couple of hours or so by people, a couple of young children we saw laying some of the fiat flowers um, with simple messages, one of them uh, reading, Rest in Peace, Prince Philip, another one addressed to Her Majesty the Queen, uh, which uh, sent deepest condolences. Um, there were dozens of people, and we can just probably show you a bit further down, there were dozens of people uh, who had gathered here earlier on, but the uh, crowds have moved on. I think what's happening now is people are perhaps coming, spending a moment or two uh, to reflect and uh, then moving on. Uh, but it has become the focal point, of course, because uh, this is where uh, the Duke of Edinburgh died peacefully uh, this morning. And 
for the Queen herself, I think people's thoughts are with Her Majesty the Queen, who is now a widow, and uh, her life will no doubt change now. She is no longer, or has no longer, her husband, who she described as her strength and stay. Uh, so thoughts uh, from all those around here uh, with Her Majesty the Queen here this afternoon. Helena, many thanks. Our correspondent, Helena Wilkinson, there at uh, Windsor. Well, for viewers just joining us, uh, just to uh, remind you that uh, this is a special programme brought to you by BBC News uh, following the announcement by Buckingham Palace of the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. In a statement, the palace said that uh, His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Well, we can speak now to the royal biographer and broadcaster Giles Brandreth, uh, who joins me now. Um, hello there. Thank you so much for joining us here on BBC News. Um, you have written on uh, the, the royal couple. Uh, you wrote a book on uh, the marriage of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh um, in uh, 2004. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment, but we've heard so much in the last few hours about the Duke's life, about what a long, interesting, richly textured life he lived. Um, how do you think he'll be remembered? Well, today it's the end of an era, the end of the extraordinary life of an extraordinary man. But the principal role that he had was to support the Queen. And if we regard the present Queen's reign as a success, and I think most people do, the joint author of that success has to be Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. That fundamentally was what he was all about. He did a multiplicity of other things uh, that served many generations. When the news broke this morning, my grandson, now 16, happened to be doing charity work as part of trying to get his gold Duke of Edinburgh's award. So he's impacted the lives of millions of people around the world. But essentially today is the day of feeling such sadness, such sympathy for the Queen who met him when she was a little girl, who fell in love with him when she was a teenager, and who's been married to him since 1947, since before I was born, since before most of us were born. He was there at her side, her absolute rock. For the Queen, of course, driven by duty, she is sustained by faith, and it's her faith, I imagine, today that is, for her, the only consolation, and also a sense of gratitude to have had this companion for so long and to have also had recent months with him. We keep hearing, and quite rightly, her quotation, or two quotations, one where she talks about him being her strength and stay, and another where she talks about him being her constant strength and guide. But what I remember most, having seen them together, is how he made her laugh. He was a very funny man. He was a good companion. And it's easy to forget that nobody really treats the Queen quite normally. There's an invisible moat around the Queen at all times. Even her children, when they meet her first at the beginning of the day, have to bow or curtsy. The only person in the world who could treat the Queen as a, as a woman, as a wife, was Prince Philip. And the only person in the world who could say to Prince Philip, oh, Philip, do shut up, was the Queen. And she did. <laughs> a unique position for both of them. Um, you spoke about um, his um, unfailing support for the Queen, but we heard from our royal um, correspondent, Nicholas Witch, a little earlier, that they were complete opposites as characters. Totally. She is, Nicholas is completely right on all of this. Uh, she is conservative. Uh, she um, is quite she doesn't really want change. She follows precedent, whereas he was dynamic, questing. Or, and, but between them, this tension seemed to work remarkably well. Uh, the Queen's private secretary once said to me, I said, why is she so conservative? He said, oh, it's, it's deliberate. She goes at the pace of the slowest person in the kingdom so that no one should ever feel left behind. And the Duke of Edinburgh was quite happy to leave people behind. He was racing ahead. He, he was a dynamo. Even in his 90s, the last time I saw him, the last time he attended one of the gold award ceremonies for the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, he was in his mid-90s. And he came into the room and ran, ran towards the podium and jumped up on it. And one of his few consolations, I think, towards the end of his life is that he was never photographed once walking with a stick. He was absolutely ramrod backed right to the end. Quite a, a remarkable figure. 
Indeed, indeed he was. Um, talk to us a little bit about his background, because he was both of royal blood, but saw himself as an outsider. He was both royal and an outsider. In fact, he was more royal than the Queen. Both the Queen and Prince Philip are great-great-grandchildren of Queen Victoria. Uh, but the Queen is only royal on her father's side. Prince Philip was royal on both sides of his family. There wasn't a king, queen, czar, kaiser to whom he wasn't related. But at the same time, his grandfather was the king of Greece and indeed assassinated. His father was a prince of Greece and was forced into exile in the year that Prince Philip was born, back in 1921. And Prince Philip spent the first 10 years of his life, though royal, living in exile in Paris. And then, before he was 10, Prince Philip's family broke up. His mother uh, had a nervous breakdown, and his father floated down to the south of France, uh, where he ended up living with a girlfriend on a yacht. His parents split up, and the family really, well, it, it collapsed. His sisters married to different German princes, but this was the 1930s, the rise of Nazism, and Prince Philip had this peripatetic childhood, educated mostly in Britain at Gordonstone, but I once saw a visitor's book that he'd signed in the 1930s, and in the column he'd put his name, Philip of Greece, and then in the address column he'd simply put, no fixed abode. So as a young man, he had no fixed abode. He never complained about this. Indeed, when I talked to him about it, he said, well, these things happen. That's life. You've just got to get on with it. And he did get on with it. And both his school, Gordon Stoon, and then the Royal Navy, which he joined the end of the 1930s in his service during the war, they, in a sense, moulded him. The man he was reflected that generation. He was reading, not long ago, a biography of Napoleon, the Emperor Napoleon, died 200 years ago. And Napoleon once said that if you want to know what a man was like, think about the world, what the world was like in the year that man turned 21. And Prince Philip turned 21 in 1942, at the height of the Second World War. And he reflects that generation, often known as the greatest generation. He absolutely epitomized that sort of person, mentioned in dispatches during the Second World War, but he never talked about it. He, in fact, really didn't like talking about himself. One of his rules was, don't talk about yourself. Nobody's interested. He was outward looking as well as outward bound. And yet he and the Queen found this extraordinary partnership. One of my most vivid recollections of seeing them together was, oh, 10, 15 years ago, one of the last times they went to the Royal Variety performance. And in the interval, the Queen went into this reception area where lots of show business personalities were to greet her. And she, quite a small person, disappeared in the middle of the crowd. And I was standing by Prince Philip at the corner of the room and he was holding his drink and the queen was in the middle of the room and suddenly she looked up looking for him and she caught his eye and he simply raised his glass to her and winked. <laughs> and I thought, there it is. There is this special bond between these two people. No one else could do that for the queen and Prince Philip did. And so the sadness today must be that she really has lost her strength, her stay and the man who always made her laugh. Thank you so much for your memories and reflections there. That's Giles Brandreth, uh, royal biographer and broadcaster. Thank you. Well, Prince Philip didn't often give interviews, but he did appear on BBC Radio 4's Today programme in 2016. The edition was guest edited by Lord Brown, the former chief executive of BP. Lord Brown persuaded him to talk about one of his perhaps more surprising passions, engineering. Lord Brown is himself a former president of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and he joins me now. Um, hello there. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is a little-known fact about the Duke of Edinburgh. Where did this interest come from? Uh, Post-war, I believe. Uh, he looked around after the Second World War and realised that the one thing that could change the fortunes of the, this country, he called it skint in the interview I did with him, was manufacturing, and that meant engineering. So he started on uh, pursuing engineering and supporting it through manufacturing. He then uh, developed this great in interest in conservation and realized that to keep uh, an ever-increasing population of the world in health and, uh, and uh, looking to the future, 
engineers were going to solve the problem. They were going to create the infrastructure, the means whereby all of us to live on the planet without damaging the ecosystems beyond repair. And then finally, he realized that innovation was the thing that really mattered. That created great wealth. It created the future, wrote the future of great nations. And so all these three strings were related to engineering. And he became a passionate engineer. He actually probably did more for engineering than almost anyone else I can think of. He brought it into the modern age and gave it respect and credibility. That's fascinating. So he was a practical man and a forward-looking man as well. Um, you um, had uh, dealings with him uh, over the interview that uh, he did for you on Radio 4 and on previous occasions as well, I believe. And what was he like? What was he like to deal with? Well, I'm sure everyone has said almost everything already, but he was very straightforward, very clear, uh, didn't uh, suffer trivial, uh, unimportant statements uh, too lightly. Uh, didn't like generalities, wanted specifics, and most importantly, wanted practical things to happen. He, he was uh, an action person, and he believed in delivery and getting things done, not uh, moping around, not complaining, uh, but actually saying, how can we do this? Uh, and that was very much uh, in the spirit of what I believe engineers do, which is uh, solve problems for humanity. Uh, and he, he, he always demonstrated that. Uh, we had plenty of discussions. We didn't always agree with each other. And he wouldn't expect people to agree. In fact, I think if you agreed too readily, he'd turn around and try and play with you and say, well, you know, to, to, to see if you can agree with something which is counter what you've just agreed to. So he, he wanted people to, to say what they think. He wanted to debate with them. And that kept him going, and it created new ideas and new things. Mm. He sounds like a, a very engaged person, as well as being a committed person, that he, you got his full attention when you were talking to him. Oh, yes, and I could see that whenever I escorted him around, you know, uh, meetings of engineers or exhibitions. Uh, he really wanted to find out about things and find out from them about what they were doing. And he would listen and he would engage. It wasn't just how interesting, thank you so much, and going to the next person. He actually wanted to find out about things. And he was, uh, I remember going around one uh, set of exhibition, an ex exhibition of winners of uh, another medal uh, from the Royal Academy of Engineering. And he would inquire of people, well, can this be exported? You know, what can we do with it? Will it build a new industry? These were questions you wouldn't expect uh, uh, a, prince, a, a prince to ask, but actually he was there, he was ready to go. Uh, and he was interested and he compared and contrasted what he saw with other things he'd seen in his life. And so that gave him a very special place because he could say, well, I saw this somewhere else. Did you think about that? And these are very good questions. So everything you said about him suggests an independent and uh, free-spirited person. If he'd had a different life, another life, would he have made a good businessman? Uh, there's no doubt he'd make a very good chairman of the board. I think he would have absolutely the right listening capability. He'd ask the acute questions. He wouldn't let a chief executive get away with a hand-waving. He'd pin people to the ground. He'd make sure things happened. And he would encourage people because he understood how to motivate people as well. Uh, and, you know, if you were not uh, on top of your subject, uh, you would doubtless find out pretty quickly from the Duke what, uh, what he thought of you. You know, so he, he didn't, uh, he really got on with the job. So I think he'd make a great chairman. Uh, uh, pity, uh, a pity that he couldn't have been. He's a great loss. Thank you so much. That's Lord Brown, um, the former chief executive of BP. Thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Well, soon after the announcement, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson made a statement outside Downing Street. He said that Prince Philip had earned the affection of generations. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth and around the world. He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country
to have served in the Second World War, at Cape Matapan, where he was mentioned in dispatches for bravery, and in the invasion of Sicily, where he saved his ship by his quick thinking. And from that conflict, he took an ethic of service that he applied throughout the unprecedented changes of the post-war era. Like the expert carriage driver that he was, he helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people and at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this and above all, for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Boris Johnson speaking outside Downing Street a little bit earlier, while the Labour Party leader Sir Keir Starmer has also paid tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh. The UK has lost an extraordinary public servant in Prince Philip. He dedicated his life to our country. And above all, I think he'll be remembered for his support and devotion to the Queen. And all of our thoughts are with the Queen, the royal family and the British public as they come together to mourn this huge loss. Well, we can speak now to our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, who is at Downing Street for us. And uh, Vicky, MPs are to be recalled uh, given the Duke's death. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Parliament at the moment is on its Easter break. The House of Commons was due to return on Tuesday, but they will come back on Monday. And at 2.30, uh, you will hear a lot more of those kinds of tributes to the Duke of Edinburgh uh, when the House of Commons gathers. Um, those uh, tributes will be led by, of course, the Prime Minister, uh, but all sorts of MPs, ministers, people, of course, who have come across the Duke over uh, many, many years uh, will pay their respects. Now, this is something they did actually on his 90th birthday. Uh, and during that time, I think you did get a real sense, not just of that public duty, but a sense of the man himself. And I'm sure uh, many of them will have their own stories that they want to tell. So the focus, I think, then is going to be on, on what happens in terms of politics. And really, it comes to a halt for a while. Um, we are told that uh, the Prime Minister spoke to Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, after he heard the news today, and they have agreed to suspend campaigning for the elections. As you'll know, lots of important elections going on, Scotland and Wales and in England. So there will be a pause in campaigning. We don't know uh, how long for. Um, today, there will be Behind the scenes, you know, lots of talks going on about what happens next. There will be uh, operational meetings. Uh, that first one of those will be at four o'clock as they uh, government departments look at what needs to happen next. Now, I'm told that what happens here is that government very much takes its lead from the palace when it comes to things like funeral arrangements. Um, so they will facilitate really whatever uh, the palace wants. But we do know that it won't be a state funeral. So really, that normal input really from the government from for example the Ministry of Defence would be involved if there was uh, military uh, pageantry none of that uh, will be happening on this occasion and of course everyone mindful of the fact that we are in a Covid pandemic so already there's been some uh, advice really going out to the public not to gather at royal residences uh, people as we've seen have been uh, bringing floral tributes and all the rest of it but the government of course has a responsibility to keep people safe and they're urging people not to gather uh, in large crowds but I think you will get announcements from the government about things that need to be put out there in terms of uh, public health and Covid but you won't get a lot else there will not be ministers um, going out there and, and putting out the normal kind of announcements you would expect in government and the normal political campaigning we would have expected this month uh, will not be happening uh, probably at least until the funeral. Okay, many thanks. Vicky Young there, our deputy political editor outside Downing Street. Well, there have been tributes from all the nations, of course. The First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, has expressed her condolences.
I'm deeply saddened by the news that the Duke of Edinburgh has died and my deepest personal condolences go to Her Majesty the Queen and the entire royal family. First and foremost, he was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and my thoughts are with all of those today who will be feeling a profound sense of loss and grief, in particular the Queen. Uh, he was her husband of 74 years, and uh, I think we can all imagine uh, just how devastated she will be at his loss. Uh, Prince Philip, though, he lived a life of public service and deep devotion to the Queen. He had a close association, of course, with Scotland. He went to school in Scotland. Uh, I know uh, that he enjoyed all of the time he spent at Balmoral. He had a very long association as Chancellor with the University of Edinburgh. But probably above all of that, the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme transformed the lives and gave hope and inspiration to countless numbers of young people. So I think uh, we should deeply appreciate the massive contribution that he made to public life and to the whole country. The First Minister of Scotland speaking a little bit earlier. Well, our correspondent Stephen Godden is at Holyrood Palace, the Queen's official residence in Edinburgh. Um, Stephen, just describe the scene as it is now and as it has been in the last few hours uh, since news of the Duke's death uh, happened. A sombre scene outside the Palace of Holyrood House. This is, as you say, the official residence of the Queen here in Scotland. And it was here that the news of the Duke of Edinburgh's death was officially announced. It was just before half past 12 that the, the flag you see flying above the palace was lowered. And at that point, a member of the palace staff came out and pinned a notice on the railings of the palace. It was up there for about an hour, a short um, statement on there. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. The statement concluded that the royal family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. Now, the Palace of Holyrood House is, of course, geographically just across the road from the Parliament here. And as soon as the news had been announced, the flags outside Parliament were also lowered. The presiding officer of the Parliament expressing his sadness. You heard there from Nick Nicola Sturgeon, she is among the, the many tributes coming from Scotland. Now, of course, as you've heard, Scotland is in the middle of an election campaign at the moment. Uh, campaigning has now been suspended and all of the leaders of the other parties have expressed their condolences as well. As far as the scene goes here, because of the situation with the pandemic, people very much being encouraged not to gather outside the gates. You can perhaps see the police officers over my shoulder there. The, the notice was only there for an hour or so. People walking past just reflect on the message, re reading it there. there. There is a bunch of flowers were left at the bottom, but people very much discouraged from doing that. Instead, in the coming days, there will be an online book of condolence. And Stephen, it is worth remembering that the Duke of Edinburgh had many connections during the course of his long life to Scotland. Yes, he certainly did. I mean, as far as the location standing in now, the Palace of Holyrood House, it was here every summer, every July, that the Duke of Edinburgh would accompany the Queen at, during Royal Week, official duties here in Edinburgh, and then would go on to spend much more time privately in Balmoral. And of course, this is the city from where he took the title Duke of Edinburgh. He was awarded it in 19... 47, the day before he was married, and he then carried the name of Edinburgh around the world. And it is for that reason that a former Lord Provost here said that he was the best ambassador the city could have. Beyond that, he was Chancellor of the University for more than 50 years, where he really had that reputation for inquisitiveness and a, a deep learn, yearning for, for knowledge of how the university works. And I think it really is these kind of connections that people are reflecting on today. OK, many thanks. That's Stephen Godden, our correspondent outside Holyrood Palace. Well, the Duke had been in hospital recently. Our health correspondent, Catherine Burns, is here with me now. And, uh, Catherine, the Duke of Edinburgh was seen as being a man of remarkably robust health for many years. But the last decade, he was in hospital a few times. Yeah, so if we start with this most recent episode, really, it started on the 16th of February. Uh, he was checked into the hospital, the King Edward VII private clinic in London. Now, at this stage, we were told that he'd been feeling unwell for a few days, but it was a precaution that he would rest and recuperate. 
Actually, 13 nights later, we saw an ambulance leaving that hospital. And at first, people thought maybe that he'd been discharged, that he was going home. Actually, he was being transferred across London to St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Now, this is the oldest hospital in the UK, but when it comes to cardiac care, it is one of the absolute best. And sure enough, Buckingham Palace put out a statement saying that, yes, he was being treated for an infection, but also was having some tests on a pre-existing heart condition. A few days later, he had a procedure on that heart condition. We were told that it was a success. He spent another two weeks in hospital, though, before he went home. So in total, he had a month, 16th of uh, February to the 16th of March in hospital. In that time, as far as we know, only one member of the royal family, Prince Charles, managed to see him. So like so many other people during this pandemic, he had that experience of being ill in hospital without being able to see his loved ones face to face. And then just over three weeks at home in Windsor Castle with the Queen, which hopefully will be some kind of comfort to them. Very difficult. Uh, difficult, as you say, uh, a difficulty that's been experienced by so many families during this pandemic. Uh, let's take a little look back at the last few years of the Duke's life, because, as I said, he, he was remarkably strong and robust until yeah. the last 10 years. He was a sportsman. He spent, you know, so much of his life out doing energetic things. It was really when he was 90 that the first sort of problem started. So that was back in 2011. And actually the royal family were together in Sandringham when he had some chest pains. So he was flown by helicopter to hospital and then he had a procedure, which we know was a stent. Now this essentially is when you have a metal tube inside a balloon that's inserted into a coronary artery to remove a blockage. That procedure went very well and actually a few months later his grandson Prince Harry said that it had given his granddad a new lease of life. Actually though there were a few more problems after that. So in 2012 he had to go to hospital a few times with some bladder infections. In 2013 he was admitted uh, to hospital for exploratory surgery on his abdomen. And actually, the day that that happened, the Queen was visiting this building, New Broadcasting House, and on the day, one of the presenters said to her, how is he? And she said, he's not ill. And actually, he, after that, he went on to work for another four years. He didn't retire from ro royal duties till 2017. So a very, very long, active, dutiful life. A man of great stamina. Yeah. Catherine, many thanks. Our health correspondent, Catherine Burns there. Well, leaders from around the world have been paying tribute. The Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said, It was with deep sadness that I learned of the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh today, a man of great purpose and conviction who was motivated by a sense of duty to others. Prince Philip contributed so much to the social fabric of our country and the world. Prince Philip will be remembered as a decorated naval officer, a dedicated philanthropist and a constant in the life of Queen Elizabeth II. The thoughts of all Canadians are with her and the entire royal family as they mourn this significant loss. And another tribute has come in, this time from the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who said, My thoughts are with the British people and the royal family on the passing away of His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. He had a distinguished career in the military and was at the forefront of many community service initiatives. May his soul rest in peace. Well, in a moment, we'll talk to Regini Vaidyanathan in Delhi. But first, to Lebo Diseko, who is in Washington. And uh, Lebo, um, what public comments have there been uh, at this announcement? Rita, we are still awaiting a statement from the White House, but we have had a statement from Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, expressing condolences on behalf of all of Congress, saying the US Congress extends condolences for the passing of Prince Philip, whose life was distinguished by an inspiring ethic of dedicated service. We've also had a statement from former President George W. Bush, who expressed his condolences on behalf of himself and his wife, Laura, and spoke about the fact that he had had the opportunity to spend time with Prince Philip and experience his wit and charm. The statement said that he knows that that will be missed and expressed his condolences to the Queen and the British people. But we are expecting a statement from the White House. We're not entirely sure when it will come uh, for that. 
Lebu, many thanks. Lebu Duseko there in Washington. Uh, let's go now to Regini Vaidyanathan uh, in Delhi. And uh, Regini, um, the Queen, of course, uh, well known for her great dedication to the Commonwealth. Uh, but that will have been the case, too, for the Duke of Edinburgh. Just talk us through his ties to the region. Well, it's interesting, actually, because actually, even before he married into royalty, Prince Philip had deep connections to South Asia. Um, his uncle was Lord Mountbatten, the first uh, governor general of an independent India and the last viceroy of India. So he already had connections to this country uh, back then. But also, when he was in the Royal Navy, he was stationed during the Second World War in Sri Lanka, known back then as Ceylon. So they were his ties back then. Now, when he married the Queen, he and Her Majesty visited India on a number of occasions. I think we actually have some pictures that we can show you of their royal visit in 1961 when they were guests of uh, India on Republic Day. Uh, and during that visit, they visited the Taj Mahal. They travelled to a number of cities, uh, including Jaipur. And actually, Rita, uh, the uh, Prince Philip and the Queen uh, have very close links with the royal family in Jaipur. And there's a lovely anecdote that I was reading that uh, members of the royal family in Jaipur would always send a box of Alfonso mangoes to Prince Philip on his birthday because he was so fond of them. And there are no better mangoes than Alfonso mangoes, as we know. Regini, how will the Duke of Edinburgh be remembered in India? Well, I think it's those personal connections that are really what will run deep. Um, the fact that he's visited uh, on a number of occasions. But here's something that struck me as well. Of course, in the UK, as you know, the Duke of Edinburgh scheme is a big thing in schools, but it actually has also been a big thing in schools here in India. So uh, somebody was telling me how uh, they remember when they were at school doing the Duke of Edinburgh um, here in India, but actually uh, meeting Prince Philip on one of his visits to India and he personally gave her the award and uh, she will always remember that as just a wonderful memory of him and so you know I think that is what will strike people is just of course we know the ties uh, post-colonial and of course colonial ties between the two countries and uh, you know the the deep impact that the royal family has and uh, you mentioned Prime Minister Modi's statement there I mean he mentioned himself uh, that Prince Philip was at the forefront of many community service initiatives so I was quite struck at how many people have mentioned the Duke of Edinburgh scheme here to me in India as well as one of his lasting legacies. It's very interesting because a lot of people will know the Duke of Edinburgh without realising that they do because they took part in that scheme uh, and in that sense his influence really has been extremely broad. Exactly, as you say. Um, it is worth mentioning we've also had a statement from um, Prime Minister Imran Khan in Pakistan that's just come in not too long ago who also sends his condolences. He said Britain has lost a wise elder um, who imbued a unique spirit of public service. So once again, the reason I'm mentioning that is that public service is something that really is noted here in the region. Regini, many thanks. Our correspondent in Delhi, Regini Vaidyanathan there.